All right, welcome everyone to the Cartesian Cafe. We're very lucky to have Greg Yang with us here today. Greg Yang is a mathematician and AI researcher at Microsoft Research, who for the past several years has done some incredibly original theoretical work in the understanding of large artificial neural networks. Greg received his bachelor's in mathematics from Harvard University in 2018, and while there won the Hoops Prize for best undergraduate thesis, he also received an honorable mention for the Morgan Prize for Outstanding Research in Mathematics by an undergraduate student in 2018, and was an invited speaker at the International Congress of Chinese Mathematicians in 2019. Welcome, Greg. How are you doing today? Uh, thanks, Tim. This is a great opportunity to be here. Uh, yeah, great. I'm, I'm very happy to have you here. So uh, we were lucky to catch up earlier in the year over ramen in SF when you were visiting the Bay Area, and we had quite some interesting conversations. Uh, right. Why don't you uh, explain to our audience how you uh, got into math and some of the uh, hiatuses you had along the way? Uh, yeah, the, I yeah, want yeah, to dig into yeah. that. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I think like growing up in general, um, like I I just did a lot of math. So like uh, when I was so before I was twelve, I was in China. So I was born in China and I grew up there for for some time. Uh, and then like during when I went to elementary school there, you know, like my mom would buy me these like Olympic mathematics books and just like just give it to me to read and just like solve problems on my own. And uh, when I came over to the States, I also participated in math competitions. So like kind of like, you know, uh, I kind of had a history with math even before college. Uh, and then uh, when I went to Harvard, I uh took the the math 55 class uh my freshman year which like some of the audience might know as like kind of this like, infamous class uh the freshman math class like it's like the hardest or something like the hardest in the united states or something he has his own uh, wikipedia page um that like i guess like got his fame from like people like bill gates taking it and saying okay bill gates is like uh, i took it and realized i'm not a, that good at math um and uh so so but, but so that was pretty fun and uh yeah so i so i i i did like math uh, at harvard and i i uh did my freshman and sophomore year and then um yeah after that uh i actually decided to uh take a leave of absence from harvard um and at the time it was because uh i wanted to become a dj um uh, and like uh, a producer of uh, like electronic music, um, so that's so, so. There's a parallel history here, which were like kind of in high school. I got into like producing music. So I mean, at the time I was more doing like rock music and stuff. Uh, but like as I uh, got to college, I got more, you know, more contact with electronic music. Uh, and so over time, I just like made my own tracks, and so. Uh, at that point in time, I just want to try something new, you know, like if, at Harvard is kind of like, or it's not, a, it's not a Harvard thing, but just like, you know, uh, like you're just kind of in that hamster wheel of life for like, you know, for the past, what are 18, 20 years. And it's, you know, it feels like it's kind of boring, right? Like, uh, let's try something new, like something unexpected, something surprising. Uh, and I, I mean, I was really getting to the, the music at the time too. So uh yeah so i just decided to take time off and this is of course also like leveraging like harvard's kind of uh, really generous policy on taking leave of absence uh i'm not sure how long like this policy dates back to but like, i wouldn't be surprised if like this is also in place when bill gates you know and mark zuckerberg took some time off um but like essentially you can like take any amount of time off and come back anytime you want like so this, this is really nice right because you don't have to worry about uh, like it's like a safety net in some sense. They can try something like really risky, and if it doesn't work out, just come back to school and finish it up. You know. Um. So yeah. So I just decided I'm gonna take some time off and uh, like make some you know like sick beats, you know, and uh, and and uh, try to play some big shows, uh, stuff like that. Um. So yeah. So like uh like around like 2012 or so yeah i just uh yeah i just like went home for a bit also like stayed in boston area for a bit um and worked on music so uh yeah so this is like kind of like 
the my music career, I guess, uh, at that time. And but the unintentional side effect of all of this is that, um, you know, I mentioned this like hamster wheel of life, right? Uh, it, it kind of give you a break from this this hamster wheel, and like, I kind of really start to like understand myself more. I think it's just like you know, if you're in that hamster wheel, it's kind of you're always like, you know, like pedaling, and you don't have time to stop and think. But like with that break, like the the unintentional side effect was this positive side effect is that like I really had time to to understand myself, like um like you know like what what I, what I really am interested in, like what I like, and like how my brain and my body works, like stuff like that. Um, so like I read a lot of, you know, a bunch of books, like, you know, like quantum, I mean, quantum mechanics, physics, you know, mathematics, whatever, like a bunch of random things. And so like, you know, in summary, like this, uh, this period, uh, when I was, when I was about 20, um, uh, like kind of gave me, I think it really changed like who I am, like in the sense that, you know, I think the the me today is essentially the same person as you know that person after i took my leave of absence but that person is like a delta jump away from like the person a year before you know so like in terms of like my self-identity like uh, that period was like actually quite crucial actually but, just a quick question did you did you have a, 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 a i don't know a, a lack of clarity going into harvard or did you did that emerge once you matriculated to harvard uh I, I wouldn't say it's lack of clarity. I think it just, I was just like everybody else, you know, like just, I mean, like, I don't know. I'm sure like most people, when they go into college, they don't really know what they're doing. They they know like they're like good at doing things, which is why they got into Harvard or other, you know, Stanford, these kind of schools. But I, I doubt that people have a very clear vision on what they want to do other than maybe the pre-med people. Uh, who are like set on um, spending like the next 10 or whatever, 10 plus years of their, their life on medicine. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I was like, you know, more uh, like unclear than other people, but it's just that like, um, like that period really gave, gave me kind of, uh, yeah, this clarity and like this focus, this purpose of life. Um, yeah. So I haven't gotten to this, but like essentially during that period, I really just realized a couple of things. But one thing was that, like, I really wanted to uh, make AGI happen or a strong AI. <laughs> like, wow! This and this is twenty twelve when when you thought had these yeah. ideas. Okay, that's yeah, that's yeah. Pr pretty pretty early uh, to have those thoughts. Well, that, that was like when like I guess like deep learning was starting to blow up, but I wasn't aware of deep learning at the time. Um. So yeah, so so at the time, like a lot of like these kind of futuristic things really appealed to me. Um. Like making strong AI is one thing, like making something that is like much, much smarter than yourself. That sounds like such an attractive idea that like, I just decided, okay, it's like, this is like either, either this happens or I die trying, you know? Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean like among other things, I, something, other things that I found really interesting was like, you know, like, is it possible to make humans immortal? uh i mean i, I like i want to live for a long time and see like how the future <laughs> goes but but you know that sounds like not something i can like you know like i'm not like a big you know x factor in, in this kind of line of research because there's like a lot of like experimentation with like you know biomedic uh biological materials and like there's a lot of red tape regarding this you know i don't have okay. like it doesn't seem like it needs a lot of math either okay. So, like, I, okay i didn't actually realize that your 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 thoughts were so were so like kind of all over the place in some sense because because my kind of my impression of people going to harvard and taking the hardest math track is that you know they were stellar math students uh when mm -hmm. they were already applying to harvard and they just keep going in that uh line uh, and, and 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 so to what extent were you not even though i guess you were good at math when you applied to harvard, or actually did you even know you wanted to study math when you uh, applied to harvard uh i would say your characterization is kind of by and large not correct in the sense if you like, <laughs> like the absolute numbers like they are definitely like i think there's some kind of psychological bias because you know when you look at like people who win the fields medal or whatever like they would have gone through this track but they're only like a small number out of you know the the total number of people who go on 
like you know could take take math courses at harvard and like, be a math major um i by and large i think people like uh, majoring or concentrating in math which, which is like the harder terminology uh by and large they they take other fields like finance is a popular one uh tech is a popular one um like only a very small amount of people uh want and have the capability to do like a phd and like you know follow the math career because i mean to be completely fair right, it's like a very hard career oh sure sure no no sorry i uh, maybe i don't know if we're talking past each other I, I meant at the at the high school to to undergrad level the people uh -huh. who are you know harvard is an elite institution with an elite math program and i just yeah. my impression is that if you're going to go that route then it seems like you had some certainty about your interest in math but in your case because you ended up taking some time off and had all these thoughts about uh artificial intelligence and, and aging it, it, it just strikes me as un, a bit un, unusual that's all so i was just trying to figure out if you were already oh, yeah. like mm. had all those interests before going to harvard or did you go to harvard and, like then then had your like um, let me rethink a little bit yeah yeah uh yeah i think going to harvard i, I was like open to everything like okay. I, I wasn't like dead, dead set on doing math for life or anything like that uh i mean i knew math is a powerful tool but it's not like yeah, it wasn't, you know, I definitely wasn't that set on being a professional mathematician. I don't feel like, and I don't feel like, you know, most other people are like in the math department are also, you know, kind of like, like what you're thinking. I feel like there's slightly more like me. Um, I mean, especially, uh, okay, maybe just to clarify, right? Like uh, for Harvard, when you enter Harvard, at least at the time, I think it's still the same uh, right now. But when you, when you enter Harvard, you don't choose a major actually. So they let you explore for like a year and a half before they ask you to decide a major. Mm. So, so in that sense, like when you get, you might be uh, accepted based on, you know, your math capabilities, but like you're not forced to choose, you know, a path until you, until you explore for like sufficient amount of time. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, so yeah. So I feel like you know, the people I interacted with, you know, they, they were, they were all good at math and, like some people are definitely are thinking about like the professional mathematician route, but uh, most people I think are thinking about all kinds of different opportunities in life. You know, I see. So um, actually, if I recall, actually, you had two two like hiatuses, right? You had one to become or to 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 go further into yeah, your music yeah, yeah, career, yeah. and then you had another one for math. Let's wrap up the 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 first one. So the first one you yeah. wanted to go into your music career. How did that? Where did that end up yeah, going? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, so, yeah, so I essentially produced a bunch of tracks and then, uh, yeah, and then like I said, read more and more about like artificial intelligence. I just like started spending more time on that. And like, so I, I just, I ended up like kind of, you know, like slowly decreasing the amount of time I spend on music. I produce some like nice tracks, so, you know, but, okay. uh, are they, but are I, they publicly like, available? Yeah, uh, they are, but I need to find it. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. Maybe we, we, we could post yeah, yeah, it uh, yeah. later. Okay, great. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's not like I play like Coachella or anything. Like, it's just like a very, very tiny, tiny career uh, okay. in music. Um, but uh, yeah. So so during that time, yeah, I realized I want to make AGI happen. Uh, and then uh. There are two other realizations that are kind of synergistic with this. But the other thing is that, like, you know, before I knew I was good at math, but like after taking a break, I really like realized that I like fucking love it. Like, so you can, you can like, censor this out if you want. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, man. Uh, I, no, no, I, we, you're not the first person to cuss on, on, on okay, on okay, 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 okay. Yeah. But yeah, I fucking love math. Like, it's, it's really something I think. You know, in psychology, they talk about int intrinsic and extrinsic motivation or reward. And this is like a case where I think, uh, like, you're in a hamster wheel for so long, the extrins extrinsic reward overpower your intrinsic motivation for a long time. But like taking kind of a break and just like, you know, like, and don't, don't worry about what anybody else think or like what the society demands of you. Like, it really brings out this intrinsic motivation. So I realized I really love this shit. And um, um, so this is a, the, the the second realization after the AGI thing. And then the third thing that ties all these together is that I also recognize that like math is really the fundamental language for essentially anything in science. 
and uh, very likely like to make good uh, advances in anything, including in AI. Like you need a very solid uh, foundation in math. And I mean, I, I, I learned very quickly as well. So like, I just like essentially decided to like read everything in math and like kind of know all the, at least I all know, know the, all the basics of the major branches of math. Uh, so so this was this was during your second hi hiatus or or, or break the first, from Harvard, right? So the first, oh, the first. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. So this this already started, yeah, pretty early on, like around twenty twelve ish. Okay. Um, so I decided to just like read everything from the beginning, in the sense of like I'm gonna start with like set theory, and then just like, read the set theory and understand like all the basics, like the Warren's lemma, whatever, and and then like go up from there. I mean, there's like basics like you know, linear algebra, then like abstract algebra, so on and so forth, geometry you know, analysis, it kind of just builds your way up, you know, like all the way to like, you know, category theory, uh, I don't know, harmonic analysis, whatever, you know, um, just like all the kind of main branches of math we know about today. It's just like to gain like a good foundation so that I don't, I don't have blind spots, so to, so to speak. It's kind of excessive in some sense, because like, you know, when you want to do research in any particular field, you don't need all these other, you know, extraneous knowledge, perhaps. But I mean, like, do you, like in my view, there's a lot of synergies between all of these different branches of math, and like letting you see everything that humanity knows. I mean, which I don't claim to be, but like, I try to try to go go toward that goal. Uh, it really lets you see things from an equals eye point of view, you know. Sure. Um, yeah, I think. Um, I mean, like, uh, like as a comparison, you know, I think it's not inaccurate to say that, like, for example, a lot of people in like half the people I say in machine learning they uh you know they they would be kind of uh, afraid or like kind of uh you know like stop in their tracks if they see like complicated math they'll kind of be turned away in some sense you know like and and that kind of prevents you from doing things that you could do if you have more knowledge hmm. uh so this is kind of just just saying like just as an post hoc evaluation of my choices like I normally don't have this problem, right? When I do research, like if I see compl complicated math, I just like look at it and I mean, like, I, I will be able to understand it, you know, much better than if I don't have the background. Sure. Okay. So, so you had some self-study, you went back to Harvard and then you took some time off again. Can, uh, can you explain? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, there? right. So, so I, I kind of went back for Har to Harvard for a semester, uh, just because I want to like kind of, uh, see my friends, you know, I made at Harvard uh before they finish off so this is like the last semester if i uh would have continued without break and then um yeah then took some time off yeah to to just like really you know like drill through this this uh, goal of like reading all the foundations um so like that so so yeah so first time i took like a year and a half off and I went back for a semester and then the second time i took two years off and this is like just purely like there's no music in this case. It's just purely like kind of you know reading and learning as much as possible as fast as possible. Yeah, and that's that's interesting because you're are you're at Harvard. You're at one of the most elite institutions. Clearly, you have much to learn from your your top notch professors and peers. And nevertheless, you took two years off for self study. Uh, can you ex explain your motivations for doing that? Yeah. Um... Right. I mean, uh, like the way I see it, which I, I think is not like that extraordinary, is that um, for like really foundational stuff, there are really good textbooks that are like battle tested over years and years of teaching by, you know, by professors and like people reading them that like probably is like, you know, much uh, on average, much better quality than like, you know, some professor's instruction on a particular day. Right. Uh, and I mean, so there are different factors to this, right? Like one, like if you can read very fast, you can like read books much faster than listening to, you know, verbal instructions. Um, yeah. Second, I mean, like there's also like, like a instructor, you know, is a person, there's like you know, variance with respect to the teaching quality, even if they're very good. Um, and I mean, and to be honest, right, like I'm sure like a lot of people have this experience, like when I take math courses, I kind of just 
a lot of times I skip the lectures and just read the book anyway. Like it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't like it make a difference, really. Okay. So in some sense, you're kind of naturally an autodidact, essentially. You, you, I mean, you're, you're. I mean, there are many yeah. reasons why one could be an autodidact, but basically, you don't have a problem learning on your own. I, I have this quality as well, and yeah. somehow, when you have the motivation, your, I mean, your bottleneck is just you go. You know, basically, you can go at your own rate. And in a way that a teacher who has to cater to an entire classroom can't exactly. kind of customize to you, you can customize to yourself. The teacher cannot, right? I mean, maybe maybe that's the point. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, this is especially true for like you know all the all the knowledge that we already know for many years. It, it's not like we're I'm not learning any like super cutting edge stuff, you know. Like, mm. like for that, you know, like if you want to learn the the most advanced stuff in you know like you know, like higher tuples theory today, okay, like probably, you know, you need to like talk to Jacob Lurie or something. But, you know, but if you if you want to know just like things we've known for 50 years, I mean, you know, there's no particular reason you can't just read books. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Anyways, so you took your two years off, came back, and, and I guess you, you were probably, well, uh, ahead of your peers, if uh, presumably, and, and then you, uh, yeah, what, what happened then? Uh, sorry, what happened after what? So, so you took two years off. Now you're this math buff, I guess, by by lifting your math <laughs> weights for two years. You come back, and uh, then then what happens? Yeah. yeah. Uh, right. So, yeah. I mean, so so, so yeah, I don't understand. Like at the time, I wasn't. You know, there was no like ambitious plan. You know, like for the next ten years or something. It was just like I knew this is probably valuable. So let me just spend time reading math, and then like whatever happens next. You know, whatever it would just happen. You know, I'll I'll just see where it goes. Um. But uh, but but the way it worked out in the end is that um, so I I came back uh to school and I was assigned a uh so I was in the math department at the time I declared my I declared my major to be math and uh so I was assigned like some random randomly assigned uh, uh like a dec academic advisor for which for undergrad just means they sign some papers and like they don't talk to you for the rest of it, you know? Um, but I, I got assigned to, uh, you know, Xin Tong Yao. So you, you must be very familiar with Yao from like Klabi Yao manifolds. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so, so from this, you know, I didn't expect, you know, too much. I had no expectation of, you know, talking to him too much, but somehow like we did get to talking and like, over like multiple interactions, uh, he learned about like some of the papers I, I wrote uh, when I was uh, on, in my time off. Uh, so in particular, I wrote like this one paper on like, some surprising connection between algebraic topology and uh, like computational learning theory. So, I mean, in a gist, without going into too much detail, uh, like the VC dimension, which is uh, like a very fundamental notion of like harness uh, complexity of a class like to in terms of learning like how hard is it to learn like a hidden function uh this this vc dimension is captured by like the the homology of some natural space associated to the to the the to the function class um okay so that's like a one sentence summary but like going forward uh like kind of uh back to the the story um so he he really liked that paper uh you know like, uh, would, he didn't he didn't ever explain why but he just like started inviting me to like parties and like events and stuff like that <laughs> and okay. I, I i just i like, guess okay he must like my papers i guess you know and like he like you know arranges for me to meet like visiting researchers or whatever um so yeah so we became really good friends and um yeah so then like uh you know like the end of the semester uh when i was trying to uh yeah when i was trying to see like uh what i should do next um like he we had a conversation uh and you know i told him at the time i, I was interviewing at google and then he's like oh no, no 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 uh you should go to microsoft and the next day i get like this email from uh harry shum who was like the head of our research he's like one of the you know leadership uh, below the CEO, um, and uh, and then yes, he he just like you know asked like asked me to chat with uh, Jennifer Chase, who was the uh, uh, head of the New England uh, lab in MSR in Microsoft Research, 
And then like we had a good a conversation, me and Jennifer. And then she also put me in touch with Mike Friedman, uh, who you know is is another like uh big fields medalist uh, who worked on point correct conjecture. Uh, but he, but he's been working at Microsoft on quantum computing for some time on topological quantum computing, and and so when we chatted, I think we really resonated because like I think in my heart I'm like kind of a topologist and like uh, definitely the paper I was you know the the Yao liked was like on this topology and uh, computational learning theory, and of course Mike himself is you know somebody who won like wide recognition for his topological work and then now he's working on like the intersection of, you know, topology and uh, quantum computing. So I think we really resonated. Um, and at the end of the conversation, like he just kind of went back to Harry and just be like, I'll just hire this guy. Like, nice. Don't ask any questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So then like, I got a like kind of call like a couple of days later from Harry and Harry was like, you know, like I got two fields medalists telling me to hire you. Right. If I, if I don't hire you, then fuck me, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so then that's how, essentially how I got into uh, MSR um, in like around 2017-ish. Very nice, very nice. Okay, great. Well, that I think that's a great story, and that takes us to to uh, what what you've been doing since then. So why don't we just get straight to it? So sure. today we're, we're going to be talking about your body of work uh, known as tensor programs. Uh, it right now spans five very technical uh, papers. Um, the way I wanted to organize this conversation, well, first of all, I invited you on selfishly, essentially, because I wanted to understand your work better. Um, but of course, in order to uh, uh, make this maximally worthwhile and enlightening, I thought it'd be good to put it in a greater context. And we'll see right. if this succeeds or not. But basically, yeah. you know, let's just take a step back. Um, you're, so you're you're an AI researcher, and right now uh, there's an AI revolution going on. Uh, yeah. Right at, right as we talk, you know, Chat GPT has been the rage, and before that, stable diffusion and many other things. And and people are very aware now of the power of AI. And part of it is that models are getting larger. Um, and part what 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 your theory does is to try to have a theoretical uh, grounding. Uh, an analysis of what happens when neural networks get larger in a very specific sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, a lot of your work builds upon uh, studying random matrices and nonlinear functions of it. Mm -hmm. And so I think th the way I wanted to organize this discussion is to kind of think about your body of work in the context of this concept of letting objects get larger. So you right. have random objects that are, that are, have a certain size. And as that size gets larger, things can simplify. And so that's that's kind of like the big idea that I think we can sort of nest your your work in. And I think that's uh, that will be helpful because people will have seen things like the central limit theorem and then right. uh, things like random matrix theory, and then we'll uh, eventually get to your work. How, how, does that, how does that sound? Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Okay, great. So I've, I've spoken a bit. Let me, let me actually uh, kind of repeat that in writing. So there's, there's a capital N, which I think will, uh, which I will let go to infinity. And uh, in this limit, this large n limit, let's say things simplify. Okay, that's like the overall concept of what we're going to be talking about. And the way we're going to pursue this route is by the following. So first, we're going to review this, we're going to have a warm up, where we'll uh, re review this large n limit concept in the context of the law of large numbers and the central limit theorem. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, here we think of n as the number of samples. So these are classical results about what happens when you sample uh, repeatedly uh, from a distribution and what right. happens when you take certain averages or, or, or scaling limits thereof. Then we're going to go over random matrix theory. Right, which is basically an n by n version of this, you're gonna have a random matrix that is the entries are random, it's n by n and you let n 
get large. And then uh, basically there are some very nice results coming uh, uh, that arise from looking at the eigenvalue distribution of these right. uh, random matrices, right? So that's, that's what's going to happen there. Then we're going to look at tensor programs. Oops, tensor programs, right? And correct me if I'm wrong, but as I was thinking about this, um, I think the tensor primes could be thought of as some kind of nonlinear compositional central limit theorem. Does that does that sound kind of accurate to you, or is that uh, is that an unfair kind of uh, summary? Yeah, I'll say it's kind of like a nonlinear compositional uh, law of large numbers. Ah, okay, okay, sure, okay. We we, we yeah. like yeah, or law of large numbers. Let's say yeah, okay. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to use your tensor programs um, to, uh, uh, well, we're going to get new proofs of random matrix theory results. So that will validate uh, sort of the value of the tensor programs. And I think, of course, the real, in some sense, value of the tensor programs is what it has for uh, neural network training, right? So implications. Yeah. For neural network theory, right? So here we have an n by n matrix. Here you could think of n as the the size or the width of the neural network. Yeah, and the the common unifying theme is that uh, in 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 these different settings, you have a random object, right? You have some uh, random variable, you have a random matrix, you have a neural network with some random weights. And as the size goes to infinity, the analysis becomes tractable, right? Yeah. I realized actually before I, I, I kind of maybe took over a little bit, I, I, I said all this stuff, but I should have let you describe what tensor programs are. Can you, do you want to say <laughs> like your TLDR of what tensor programs are? Because I, I just sort of s put this outline without actually letting you speak about it. So what are, what are tensor programs and how did, how did you, what, what, how did you come about this this concept? Um, yeah, so uh, maybe in a sentence, I would say like, oh, so there are two parts. Okay, maybe, maybe not one sentence, but two sentences or something. There are two parts. Uh, the first part is kind of like this um, this set of rules for expressing computation, uh, which is essentially you know matrix multiplication and entry wise like nonlinearity functions essentially. It's just as, like roughly speaking, like anything you can write in PyTorch or TensorFlow, these like deep learning computational frameworks uh, can be sort of quote unquote compiled down to this kind of low, lower level language. So this is the first part. It's kind of like the formalization of the rules of the computation. It's kind of like a, you know, like a Turing machine, you know, like just kind of Turing machine formalizes the rules of computation for computation, you know, that this is like formalizing the rules for computation for deep learning. Mm. Um, and the second part is like this, a large number or essential limit aspect of this, which is that when you like randomly sample the matrices in such programs, like you can obtain like really general insights about what happens when the size of the, uh, the matrices go to infinity in such a program. So like it, concretely in like for, you can, you can implement random matrix theory inside of this framework. And in this case, like the size of matrices are just the size of matrices in random matrix theory. Uh, you can also implement like all of you know deep learning inside this uh, language, and in that case, like the size of matrices in the program correspond to like the width of the neural networks. Um, but but it's like a very you know flexible language, just like you know, Turing machines are very flexible in terms of expressing computation. Um, okay, so that's like the rough gist of uh, what tensor programs are. Uh, I can also talk briefly about like the history. Um, but yeah, roughly speaking, uh, like when I yeah when I when I joined uh, Microsoft in twenty seventeen, like I was already exploring like uh the behavior of random neural networks, uh like so like so called the initialization. So what that means is that like the neural network just have random ways and you haven't done really anything with it, um and then just trying to understand its behavior. So. You know, there's like a very well-known behavior of such networks from like 20, 30 years ago, uh, known as this uh, neural network Gaussian process correspondence. 
So in other words, like, you know, a random neural network in the sense of like the weights are randomly sampled, like can be uh can be shown to be uh a Gaussian process in the limit as the width of the network or number of neurons per layer, which is the width, this width goes to infinity. Um so this so this is like a well-known result uh from a while ago for like uh you know one hidden layer neural network. Um and then like when I was starting to do research, like there were essentially some more like you know activities in in that area in terms of like deep networks and uh at the time like most of the works were done by like you know like physicists essentially so they were kind of very flippant about you know were like not rigorous about like the the ways they manipulated some of the equations and i think as a mathematician i was kind of uh like not super satisfied with that so my motivation at the time was to uh you know like to understand like it, it, can I convince myself that this is all good? You know, like in, in, in any circumstances, like the assumptions they made, like in terms of these like physics, like calculations are okay. And so like driven by this motivation, I kind of like realized, oh, like all these different things you do for these different architectures that people were writing about actually can be distilled into like this simple form, like this low level language, like which is essentially the like, tensor programs that like, essentially has two instructions one is matrix multiplication and uh like and these entry-wise non-linearities so it's essentially as long as you can express your computation in these two forms like you can't express like you know resnet in this form you can express transformers in this form as long as you can uh, express them in this form you can like kind of in using kind of mechanical calculation to calculate the the, the behavior of the infinitely large neural network so okay. that's how, how it came about, just like driven by motivation to understand the behavior of large neural network, especially, you know, like kind of to 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 convince myself that like all the physics, the physics way of doing things is actually correct in some circumstances. OK, great. Um, all right. Why don't we actually just dive in because we've uh, sure, maybe yeah. we've, we've uh, uh, waxed poetic for long enough. Also, Greg, why don't you explain us the law of large numbers? Yeah, yeah. OK, so so I mean, the, the most trivial case of the law of large numbers, oh, let me just maybe write down, this is a law of large numbers. Oh, wait, oops. Um, right, so so the, the most trivial case Okay, maybe maybe before you know talking about exactly what it is, you know, like in uh, lots of situations, you you add up a lot of things, right? And in general, you you like sometimes you want to understand like how how does this behave when you add up a lot of things together. So I mean, the most trivial case of this is like okay, you like you know you, you suppose you buy one orange every day, and you buy it for like hundred days straight. Okay, how many oranges are you gonna have, right? Obviously, you know, just you just one plus one plus you know so on and so forth. Right. And there's like a hundred of these, and this is like a hundred. So, I mean, in general, like the, the sum, you know, like the sum, if you have uh, instead of a hundred, you have uh, n of these, then, like, you know, like you have, you know, the, the, the total is n. So, in other words, if you have. You know, if you divide this by n, you just get one, which is like kind of what you're adding every day. I mean, this is entirely trivial, right? Like, you know, if you're in kindergarten, you, you know this. So like the law of large number is just like really, in, in essence, just like saying that it was the slightly more complicated case where you like, you know, like suppose you flip a coin every day. And if, uh, you know, if the coin is positive, is heads, you buy two oranges or his tails, you buy zero oranges. Right. So like now, you know, instead of buying like very certainly one orange every day, you it's a, it's a stochastic thing. It's like a random thing. And you're, you're buying on average, you're buying one orange every day. So now you can ask, OK, like if, if I have like this, um, I'll just call this X for the number of orange um, on, on, uh, on day one and day two, so on and so forth. So like. This is like the orange number number of oranges bought on 
say 100, for example. Mm -hmm. And I do the same thing and divide by n. Then law of large number says you can ignore all the noise, right? Like it's it's the same. The answer essentially will be the same when n is large as if you're just buying one orange every day, where one is, is equal to the you know expected number of orange you buy every day, right? So this this will be one, right? If if again like the condition here is that like you know um like two oranges. two oranges or zero oranges with probably one half each. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I guess you didn't really mean equals to one. If it's equals to one with some, what's with some. Yeah. Error. So, so like, uh, or maybe I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, or, okay. I'll, I'll just say this, uh, as n goes to infinity. Or in here, this is like not a hundred, but n. Right. Mm -hmm. So 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 again, like in other words, the law of larger number says if you're averaging things, if you're adding like hundred things and divide by by dividing by a hundred, then like when when this hundred is instead of instead not hundred but like a thousand or you know ten thousand, then like you can forget about all the noise, you know, in each each uh know like random variable here you can just look at the mean and that's the only thing that matters right so um like yeah or maybe it's not so much uh maybe uh maybe being a little pedantic but it's not so much noise as variance right because it's like there's zero oranges and two oranges i i don't know uh, uh i'm not sure what to think of as noise but the point is that the uh if you average over th average over those two yeah. two with respect to the yeah. underlying probability measure which we said was a, a half uh, for each yes, case, yeah. then it's the one orange in expectation. What what what's what's um uh the thing the thing is that there, there's fluctuations, right? Like there are like yeah. there is there is there is one run in which you actually buy two all two oranges every day, and there is another run in which you end up buying no oranges every day, right? But those are relatively rare, right? And it becomes right. more yeah. rare as n goes to infinity, right? So there's basically okay, the fluctuations, yeah. the variance goes to zero exactly. as n gets yeah. large. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So, like, if you want to formalize this, the rigorous version of law of large numbers is that if, like, you know, x1, x2, and so on and so forth um, are all, uh, all like, I'll say id for, in case people don't know, it's, uh, independent and identically uh, distributed. Yeah, we'll assume our, our readers know what that is, but uh, basically, it's you can think of the x i's as as independent coin flips, where the coin has the same distribution every time you, yeah, you flip yeah. the coin, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a quintessential uh, example. Yeah, they're all ID. Uh, then, you know, like um, I'll just, I'll just write this out. Then, like you know, taking the the sum. Of the initial sequences and then dividing or like averaging them out, uh, this will converge uh, to the expectation of like any one of these mm -hmm. um, as n goes to infinity. And if you are more pedantic, more more pedantic, you can like say like what exactly is this notion of convergence? Like there there are many of these. Like you know, like almost sure that's the strong law of large number. If you if you say it's almost sure. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty much it, right? Like, sure, I think yeah, like we... everybody has some like, intrinsic feeling for this kind of thing. Like, when you average a large number of things, you get the, the mean. Sounds good, yeah, yeah. We, we were it's uh, it would be uh too far afield for us to go into uh the different notions of convergence, but but intuitively, it, it means that with with uh, you know, uh, near certainty or, you know, or, or certainty that it's it kind of can't cap encapsulate it with the English language, but with certainty, when you flip your coin, when you sample all these variables, ID and average them with certainty, you will get the expected value. It's sort of like thinking, like, if you pick a random real number with, uh, with probability one, you're going to get an irrational number rather than a rational number. You could kind of think of it that way. Like, like, I guess technically you could get a rational number, but it just, 
it's just never going to yeah, happen yeah. In, in some in some formal sense. Again, right. the English language is, is too coarse to to capture yeah. the notion of measure zero, but you can think of it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah, yeah I mean, you can also be like more quantitative, and you can say that like essentially for any finite but large n, like the probability that this average, this empirical average, is is like very far away from this expectation is small. Like, the probability right, right. of the event yeah. is small. Exactly. The there's like a calculus epsilon delta uh, notion of of making this rigorous. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But anyways, okay, great. So this is the law of large numbers. Uh, did you want to say anything else about it, or should we go on to to the central limit theorem and how uh, how it's a different kind of large? Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll just say that like um, when eventually when we go to tensor programs, like the the key the master theorem, which is the name of the kind of the one theorem that you need to know uh, in that theory, is formulated in this way. Like kind of like when you take average of certain things that are actually not ID and like in, fa in fact they're going to be in general correlated it tells you what the like the limit of this uh, average is and it's, so it's it's formulated in a way that's for, most akin to the law of large numbers you're, you're mm -hmm. averaging a bunch of things that are correlated like how do you think about this average because now you have correlation like you know how do I should I assume the correlations is just like you know zero or like does it you know cause the limit to differ? So this is like the, one of the, the most important consequences of the tensor program. It tells you when like correlations arise from this kind of like matrix multiplication, entry-wise nonlinearities, like how should you think about this? Yeah, just, I mean, just to make this more clear. So in the, in the uh, okay, let's not get too deep right now, but I just wanted to unpack what you said and then let's just move on yeah. and it'll make more sense to come back. But basically the key thing in the law of large numbers is this IID assumption. And in the right. tensor programs, we're going to replace that uh, with, well, they're not IID, but they're going to be sort of, uh, the xi's will be non-trivial functions of the previous ones, right? So, so that's what we meant earlier by nonlinear compositional, uh, you know, central limit theorem or law of large numbers. Basically, the xi's can be nonlinear functions of each other. Sure. Right? Yeah. And so, so basically, yeah. that's that's where the heavy lifting comes about, right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Right. And the XIs are basically the hidden hidden units in a neural network. That's that's yeah. that's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like great. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm actually great that we 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 covered it this way because then already here we can kind of get a feel for what Tensor Programs is about. That's right. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, great. All right. Are we ready to go to the central limit theorem? Yeah. Let's do it. So central limit theorem is a different uh, theorem from the low large numbers, uh, but it's you know, very intimately related. So, um, you know, so in, in the in the you know the the scenario we had before, we had these random variables, you know, like uh, x one, x two, and so on. They're all ID. Um, but you know, assume assume you know the the mean is zero. So if you know mean of uh, expectation of uh, x1 is zero, then like, you know, the law large number says that, um, that this, this mean over n things, you know, like the limit as n goes to infinity, this will go to zero. This mean goes to zero, right? Because we have assumed the expectation is zero. So this scenario, you know, is uh, so the scenario that you know when you average, you know, uh, these things, these random variables with zero uh, expectation, then you get zero in the limit of large number of samples. So this is kind of, you know, like a consequence of low large numbers, but it's also somewhat not interesting when things go to zero. So the central limit essentially tells you like what is the what is the right scaling here to obtain a non-trivial result, and what is the non-trivial result. So so central limit theorem says the following that instead of if instead of uh dividing by n you divide by square root of n instead then you know taking the limit uh gives you a gaussian distribution um i'll just say like uh sigma square here where uh, expectation x1 square equals sigma square. Mm -hmm. 
this is the variance of yeah. this one, right? Okay, great. That's right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, so what does you know this uh, imply? So, the one way to think about this uh, in connection with a lot of large numbers is that uh, you can roughly understand a sum of uh, n i d things with zero mean uh, and variance sigma squared as roughly equal to n. Uh, well, actually, sorry, like, let's say, let's say, um, let me just say this, like, expect, let's say expectation of x1 equals mu, which may be non-zero, and then expectation of x1 squared equals sigma squared. So this is a more general scenario than the one we assumed just now. Um, but back to the situation, right, like, if you're adding n things, uh, each thing being a, an independent copy of this random variable with mean mu and variance sigma, then you expect the sum should look something like uh, n times mu plus square root of n times uh, sigma. Mm -hmm. uh, times, okay. a, Let... times a Gaussian, like a, like a Gaussian. So I it's kind of so... like a asymptotic expansion, you know, if you're familiar with that, for, for example, from physics, of like how you should think about a sum, right? Like so the dominant term is the mean, it scales linearly with a number of samples n, and then the sub dominant, the sub leading term, the next lead, sub leading term is uh, proportional to like a Gaussian with scale square root of n, where n is a number of samples, right? And they're mm -hmm. like in some some low order terms as well, low order terms, but um, mm -hmm. like but like the the top two terms are the most famous ones, so you know like this. So this is this term is the law of large numbers, and then this term is the central limit theorem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, yeah, maybe maybe just uh, is it maybe one, one, what? Yeah, no, 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 no. no uh, it's fine. No, uh, maybe I, I was going to say one useful fact to recall. Uh, readers of 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 uh, who've gotten this far will already know it, but it's good just to recall it, which is that if you have a uh, fact, if X and Y are independent, then the variance of X plus Y is the variance of X plus the variance of Y. And then also the variance of a scalar times X is C squared variance of X. So sort of that sort of justifies your your approximation here in some sense. Uh, of course, the f first term is just the linearity of expectations. And then the second term essentially follows from these facts I just wrote, right? Because if you yeah. sum n independent things, then uh, the variance will be n times the variance of the individual uh, random variable. And then that's how you get the second term because the square root of n changes the variance of, uh, yeah, the square root of n times sigma changes the variance of the normal distribution by the square of that, which is n times yep. sigma squared. Times sigma right? squared. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Right. So here, I think I want to point out like one basic intuition um, the, the, that I think will come back uh, later. Uh, I mean, this is, this is all like a very, very basic intuition that, you know, like, like, you know, it's, it's not like a, the key intuition behind tensor programs, but I want to point this out. It's just like a very basic thing that, you know, I think, benefits everybody if uh, they they can't understand it which is just that like when you add like random things together uh when the the fluctuation fluctuations are independent like uh they cannot in some sense they cannot conspire right like to to push in the same direction like, because the fluctuation essentially has no information between like you know different uh different instances of, of the fluctuation like the fluctuation x1 doesn't know anything about the fluctuation of xn right um as such like, they cannot like conspire to push in the same direction and so there's a lot of which is why like when you add them up instead of scaling like n like when you, when you add n things together instead of scaling like n which is the case if they can conspire to kind of push in the same direction like they don't know about each other so they can only like kind of you can only expect them to push away from zero by something smaller than n and like the the you know the basic fact of like how the variances add essentially imply that the smaller number less than n is something like square root of n, 
Yep, right? exactly. So it's like a very basic intuition that I think everybody should really understand. And like, yeah. So basically, like large number says, okay, the the mean is the only thing that can conspire to push in the same direction. And then central limit says, if you cannot conspire to push in the same direction, you get square root of n behavior. Exactly, exactly. And that follows from the fact that I just wrote, because when you add yeah. independent things, you get growth like n. But if you add n of the same thing, which is what the second thing I wrote, variance of c times x, let x be n, then you get n squared. You see, so you get another factor of n. So that's the second case is the conspiracy case. The first case is the independent yeah. case. So here, I mean, I do want to point out, right, like, when whether the mean is zero or not zero gives you like kind of two behaviors that are the two kind of like canonical behaviors right like when the mean is not zero like the in some sense the correct way of, of uh, scaling the sum of n things is to divide by n right and then you get like a non-zero and non-infinite object yeah uh, which is the expectation of the random variable but when the mean is zero like the right way of scaling it to get a non-trivial thing is to divide by square root of n Right. And this, this, like this, this, uh, kind of like, uh, change in the right scaling behavior, depending on, you know, the characteristic of the random variable. So this kind of, uh, you know, like thought process will come back later when we talk about, you know, how to like, how does this programs apply to like in training large new networks? Because in, in that case, like there are also different, you know, ways of scaling your neural networks, kind of like n or square root n here, depending on the different scenarios you're in. And that could be correct or not correct in different scenarios. And uh, like one of the main big contributions of TensorFlow is to kind of clarify and to, in fact, derive the correct uh, scaling um, in general so that you have like, you know, nice payoffs when you train large neural networks that kind of like from a more empirical perspective, it would be really hard to guess the right skating yeah indeed indeed so greg so i guess um as we were discussing uh before um it's instructive to go over a, a, a proof or a sketch of a proof of the central limit theorem because these ideas will show up again later in particular in, in the random matrix theory uh, subject right right okay right. so let's right. let's do that uh so again like there are many different proofs uh, of this but um one way to, to go about this is to First, use the fact that, um, like you know, two distributions, let's say like um, P and Q, uh, are equal, uh, if and only if um, their moments are equal. Where like by moments I mean you know like uh, expectation of you know x to the um, the like k power where x is drawn from p or q so like you know if p is then it's the pth moments and q then it's the p q's moments for for different k's so these are the moments right right so okay. so if this is true for all k. Uh, greater than or equal to one, then uh, the, the distribution is equal, like under some assumptions, under some like you know regularity assumptions. Sure, I think uh, maybe you're going to already say it, but I think the the point here is that the space of polynomials is dense in the space of continuous yeah. functions, and so yeah. if you can show for all the moments, you you can show it for any continuous function, and and, and intuitively, if if a probability distribution integrates against a continuous function. Uh, if two probability distributions agree on all continuous functions when you integrate against them, then they have to be the same. I think exactly. that's fairly intuitive, right? Yep. Yep. Exactly. So, so essentially, then, like to back to CLT, right? Um, the point is that if you can show that we just you know suffice to show that. Um, Oops. That when you add um, these n things and divide by a square root of n, uh, and then you take the k power, and then you take expectation, then 
this is going to converge to the expectation of uh, X drawn from a uh, Gaussian. Mm -hmm. Also, I'm going to assume that the variance is one from now on. It's sure. It's because you can always scale it to be so. Sure. Um, yeah. So, so, so this, so we have reduced the problem to, sh to showing like specific, you know, convergence of, you know, expectations of this powers of this sum. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is the first step. We have reduced our problem to specific, uh, to showing specific um, convergence of, you know, mm -hmm. deterministic uh, quantities. Okay. So sure. then the second step is to actually, you know, compute these quantities, these uh, powers uh, and take expectations and see like, what, what do you expect them to be? Okay, so, you know, like when you, so in general, right, when you take a sum, I'm going to use um, index uh, alpha and beta uh, here. So when you take a sum of uh, x alpha, um, and then you take this k power, right, we can essentially expand this as the sum of x alpha 1 to x alpha k over all like sequences alpha one to alpha k, right? Where um, each of them range from one to n. Right. Um, right. And, you know, when, and then when we take expectation because of linearity of expectation, you just, uh, you just get, uh, mm -hmm. you can push, you can push this inside this expectation, right? Um, good, great. So now, um, again, the goal is to kind of understand like, how this uh, the sum behave as n becomes large while k stays fixed. Okay, so so just remember this psychologically, like the the number of indices are fixed in our scenario, but uh, their range can become larger and larger. Okay, so now the next step we're going to use is to observe that. Because we have assumed, um, because expectation of x alpha is equal to zero, um, these like these kind of uh, expectation products of x alphas, they're gonna be zero if any uh, x alpha appears only once in the in in the product, right? So, for example, um. Like you know, x one, x two squared, x three to the third power. This is gonna be zero. But uh, x one squared, x two squared, is like in general not gonna be zero. Mm -hmm. Right. Like. Right. I'll just say like this. Right. And and the point is the problem is this guy has a power one, right? And you're using yeah. the fact that in, by independence. Independence means that the uh, expectation of the product is the product of the expectations, right? So, so right. the point right. is, 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 uh, yeah, you're just actually this is true for, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. So let me, let me just complete this. Yeah, right. Does and then this goes to zero. assumption. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So basically, disjoint indices in 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 general, you can factorize uh, over the disjoint indices essentially. Just, right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Great. Good. So, so what this implies is that in this big sum here, um, we only need to worry about uh the sum ends where each alpha appears at least twice. Okay. Um. Okay. So. So let me maybe just write this down. This is I think yeah. Uh, I I see where this is going now. Okay, uh, I I haven't I haven't uh, yeah I, w I didn't study this proof in preparation for our, our talk, but I I could see I think I see where great. this is going. You yeah. can uh, get a little nice surprise. Okay, all right. Well, I'll, I don't want to steal the show, but okay. I, I, I see where <laughs> this is going. Okay. <laughs> uh, up here, greater than or equal to two times. Okay. Okay. Now, so this is our like first step of you know just eliminating some of the fluffs we don't have to worry about. 
And then the next step is um to understand like what is the like the component of the sum that will dominate when n becomes large. Okay, yeah. so so for example, you know, like in these sums, you you can have the scenario where you know you have have x one squared, x two squared, and so on and so forth, x um k over two squared, for example. You can have you can have this kind of behavior, or you mm -hmm. can have like x one to the cube, x two to to the to the cube, you know, so on and so forth, or x cube to the k over three, something like this. Mm -hmm. Or we can have a mixture of these, you know, we can have like x2, uh, x1 squared, x2 cubed, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and uh, the point here is that like, when you compute, uh, when you calculate the number of terms of these kinds, like, so for example, this kind is when like every exponent is two, and this kind is every exponent is three, and so on and so forth. When you like look at how many such terms there are, then you will you notice that like this this kind where every exponent has exactly is exactly two the number of such terms will dominate the total number of terms as n becomes large yep yeah um so in other words you can kind of forget about all these other kinds of terms as n goes to infinity because they just contribute less and less uh as n becomes large so we can say that like uh, this is um kind of uh, asymptotically equal to the case where uh, each alpha uh, i appear equals to two times, All right? So, so where okay? Let me let me write it another way because in this case it's simple. Um, something like it's alpha one squared to alpha k squared over all alpha one to alpha k. Uh, k yeah, let's just, let, yeah, let's just back up a little bit. I think the easiest way to see what you're saying is, you know, look, just, just treat this as a counting problem, right? And so in, in the first term, you have the fewest constraints in the sense that here, when you, when, when you have the lowest possible non-trivial power, which is two, because we, we, we don't want powers of one, right? In this case, the number of such terms is basically n uh, uh, k over two right? power. Yeah, you have to choose k over two elements from uh, capital N, right? Because once you've chosen those uh, k over two elements from a set of n elements, in this case indices, you've already constrained them to all have power two. So the number of such terms is just this n choose k over two. Whereas, as you just wrote, if it was all three, then it would n choose k over three, which is a smaller power of n, right? And by the yeah. same logic, if you had right. higher powers, they basically kind of have each each power is like kind of you could think of it as like a, another another co-dimension in some sense in the space of all possibilities, right? And so right. so the, 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 there's a leading term and everything has kind of positive co-dimension, right? And so yep. so only only the lowest powers non-trivial powers survive. Yeah, that's right. Yep. 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 Yeah. Great. So now I'm gonna kind of just stay on this page. I'm gonna erase all, all of these. Sure. Um, okay, so now the, our mission is to uh, calculate what exactly is the sum. So first of all, like, you know, by symmetry, uh, you know, like you can evaluate this expectation and the expectation is just uh, be, be by independence, right? It's, you can just factor, uh, push in the expectation into each square of X alphas and because the, the variance of each uh, x is assumed to be one, then this, this is just one, right? And so the correct combinatorics here is um, uh, n choose, so it's like a, okay, so the, the succinct way of writing this is um, n choose uh, the multi, so this is the multinomial coefficient where you essentially choose pairs um, where they're, uh, k over two of these uh, uh, things. And mm. then times, so this is essentially counting, uh, yeah, like this is kind of counting like how many ways things can coincide. And then there's another uh, one of n choose uh, k over two. So what we just showed was the expectation of x 
one plus n divided by square root of n to the k power equals, you said it was k minus one double factorial? Yeah, so like the way I use double factorial is a bit different, but but anyway, you can just, you know, what does it mean in just this? All right, all the, all the all odd numbers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and the point is that this is also the same thing as expectation of x squared, where x is distributed as a... Yeah, so, so this is for k, k even. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, and for k odd, just zero. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, great. And so this this shows that uh, right. Yeah. So yeah, if you want to get technical, this is in distribution. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. We're we're not that fancy. Yeah. Okay. Great. That's why it's in okay. green. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, okay. Great. So. So okay, so where do we where do we go from here? All right, so so we can talk about you know like something more fancy now, which is uh, instead of looking at like a sequence of random scalar random variables, and you know taking average now we can look at like a random matrix. So, uh, you know like if you if you really read into random matrix, you can think of it as you know like using fancy words like a non commutative version of low large number essential limit theorem. Um, again, this is a, getting maybe a bit too fancy, but like uh, this is meant in the sense that like, like random matrix, like matrices uh, under multiplication, they are non-commutative. Versus um, in this case, uh, when you when you look at like you know x one, x two, x n, you can you can when you look at it from a random matrix angle, we can think of it as just like a diagonal matrix where the diagonal entries are x one to x n. Um, but in any case, I, well, let's not worry about this. Uh, uh, let me let just like kind of set the stage for what what do we care about in this random matrix setting, and um, and then like the, the analogy between the random matrix stuff and the CLT, for example, will become more clear as we try to apply kind of the same moment methods and the same ideas there. And then we will from there we'll also see you know like the classical methods of you know uh, understanding these things will look very much like what we did for central limit. Um, but we using tensor program is like a very different way of thinking about things. And mm -hmm. uh, and then from there, we can like, you know, uh, use that as a jumping point to see like how this different way of thinking about random matrices uh, translate really well to neural networks. So when we go uh, to random matrix theory, um, the the kind of the 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 thing we care about here, analogous to the uh, to central limit scenario, is that um, we want to understand like kind of the eigenvalue distribution uh, of uh, like a large random matrix, um, and the setup is typically something like this. So, um, yeah, so. If you have a, you know, I'm going to draw this picture, a matrix as n by n. So yeah, so like a very common setting is when uh, this matrix, let's call uh, let's call this a, a is uh, let's say symmetric, and um, and then a's entries, let's say are just like id id um, Gaussian uh, subject to this constraint. So essentially, what this means is that, like, uh, on the diagonal, they're all ID, but, like, you know, otherwise, like, on the upper diagonal, uh, upper triangular portion is ID, but, like, the lower triangular portion is exactly the flip of that. Yep. Mm -hmm. So so that's what I mean by ID subject to this symmetry constraint. Um, like, let's say zero, one, or something like that. And, and the question, uh, like a classical question asked in random matrix theory is, uh, what is the, like, how does the eigenvalue um, distribution 
look like uh, for A as um, and then goes to infinity. So this is the like one of the key questions. And, and just to know that um, because like we have assumed the matrix is symmetric by you know the typical linear algebra theorems, uh, the eigenvalues are real. So we're looking at a like you know for finite matrices we're essentially going to look at like a histogram of um, eigenvalues on the real line. So this is like, say like negative one to one or something. And, you know, so like um, the eigenvalues. Uh, By the way, you're going to, you're going to rescale the eigenvalues, right? Maybe you should say that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, maybe, maybe let me not like be very specific about the scale here. Okay. Okay. Yeah, let's just say, so we, essentially we're going to look at, you know, like um, on the real line, uh, like, you know, a, a histogram for, you know, any like, you know, finite matrix, you can always kind of look at the distribution like a histogram. And um, when the, the, the matrix becomes, you know, infinitely large, you have like infinite number of um, eigenvalues and that forms like a continuous distribution. Right. Yeah, I guess when you say histogram, basically, I mean, uh, uh, with with uh, you know, it's how I say it's with measure one, you're going to have matrices with distinct eigenvalues. What you're doing is actually binning, and then in those bins, you yeah. can have multiplicity, right? That's right. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. binning it here, but like, so like, yeah. if you don't bin, then you're just gonna look at like a bunch of deltas or something. Exactly. Exactly. Like, so okay. So yeah, just to be clear, the reason why you have a histogram is because you bin, but it's okay. Okay. That's, that's just a, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to clarify that. But okay. Okay. Let's keep going. Yep. Right. Oops. Um. Great. Okay. So, so how do we answer this question? Right. Like, mm -hmm. you know, matrices is like much more complicated than a sequence numbers. Um. But it turns out like you can use some of the same tricks that we used previously just now for central limit theorem. So with moment method, the, the point here is that um, when you look at the distribution, um, let's say um, P of A, this is defined to be the distribution of uh, eigen Vows of A, then um, again by the usual uh, linear algebra theorems, you have that um, the like um, x to the k where x is drawn from P A um, uh, yeah, this is like for for any like you know like deterministic even matrix doesn't have to be random like we said um is equal to the trace um of uh a to the k power divided by uh n where n is the size of the matrix again like the picture is this N by N, A is N by N. Uh, sorry. Don't you have to uh, rescale A somehow so that the, you actually get a limiting distribution? Oh yeah, yeah. So, so this is just for finite N, finite finite matrices, finite N. N is finite right now. I'm not. Oh, oh okay, okay. I'm not going okay. to infinity. This is just like this is true, like for any okay. finite. Okay. Okay. Like, so. Yeah, so let me just uh, say. Oh, I see. Sorry. So P of A is the P of A is the um, empirical measure on the eigenvalues. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So I think let's just write that out because it's uh, you know Can you write we, are, we are going very deep here. So 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 sort of the so another way of writing it, P of A is the called empirical measure. I guess for the eigenvalues. Of a, which basically means it's the measure such that you have one over n, and you have a direct delta for each uh, yeah. eigenvalue. Yeah. Right? So you need a one over n so that it's a probability measure, and then you just uh, you you have a you know you count one for each eigenvalue. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's okay. Right. Good. Yeah. Good. 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 Okay.
Okay, so so the yeah, so the point here is that like you can manipulate some like gross characteristic in the sense of the moments of the eigenvalues by taking powers of the matrix A uh and then taking the trace. Okay. So this allows you like this this trace of you know powers of A directly gives you the the moment of the empirical distribution of the eigenvalues. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so this is how we're gonna like use moment method through the trace of the powers of the matrix. In the in the like non matrix case, you had the central limit. Then that says that distribution of a sum of bunch of things with zero mean and independent distribution, like becomes like a Gaussian, right? When the number of things is large. Uh, in this case, we're asking, okay, what does the eigenvalue distribution look like for a large matrix, and uh the answer is not a gaussian distribution uh you know like as you maybe would guess if you're coming off from the central limit perspective but actually the limit is a uh a, a, a semicircle distribution so let me kind of just write this down so like clt right says um that um This uh yeah so CLT says you know this will converge to a sh like the distribution of um this scale sum will converge to distribution like this which is like a a Gaussian mm -hmm. with zero mean and you know some variance and then like this this thing uh called the semicircle law says that um if you have like this you know random matrix n by n and then you take the eigenvalues i'll just call it do it call it like this then when n is large the shape is a semicircle where this is zero okay so so like the the limiting distribution looks different right sorry but here um, here now you better uh divide by some power of n to, to get your limiting yeah but but i i didn't put a scale here i just say semicircle shaped right which is still true it just said the scale is kind of going to infinity if you don't scale. yeah sure sure okay okay fair enough okay yeah, I, I mean like you know i don't the point here i want to make it just that the shape is different okay okay um but nevertheless like even if the shape is different uh you can still using you can still use the met moment method to get what you want um and i'll just briefly sketch how this would go the argument Okay. Um, so just like in the central limit case to prove the semicircle law you want to show that um for this uh for this uh random matrix random a as before you want to show that the expectation now like taking over a of the trace of a to the k um divided by n um and uh also i'm going to scale this additionally uh by uh n to the k over two so so i'm going to show that like this the scaled version of the trace of the power of k uh will converge to uh the um the essentially you know this where x is drawn from the semicircle mm -hmm. okay okay and um just like before in the clt case like this this trace of ak you can actually expand it as a sum like before, it was very simple. We're just expanding a, a power of a sum of scalar things. Now we're expanding powers of the matrix and the trace of that. Uh, right. but, but you can still uh, expand this. And essentially, you're just going to get something like this, uh, alpha 1. Uh, so you're going to get a product of entries of A, uh, where you're going to have something like A of alpha 1, alpha 2 times A of alpha 2, alpha 3. Mm -hmm. so on and so forth and then a of um alpha k 
alpha one, right? So like yeah. this thing loops mm -hmm. back. Right? Yep, yep, yep. Um, great. And then uh, the you you want to take expectation of this, All right? So so right. now it looks you know some somewhat familiar from as yep. before. Uh, and you know, the task now is to figure out like okay, what is the dominant term here? Uh, and as before, you can like you know see that because you know a's entries have zero mean like if you know any of the a alpha one alpha two appear once exactly then the whole term is going to vanish so the only things that are interesting are terms products where uh each a alpha one alpha two appears two or more times mm -hmm. and then just as before uh the dominant terms are exactly those where alpha, each a alpha one and alpha two appears exactly twice right and uh, whereas before there was like a, some like easy combinatorial counting, which you know we can still get wrong if we're not very experienced. But 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 here where the combinatorial uh, description becomes uh, graphical, in the sense that like you can think of like the 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 sequences alpha one, alpha two, and so on and so forth, uh, as like um, choices of vertices on a graph. So so the graph is a fully connected graph with n vertices. And then, like you know, each alpha i is a choice. It, it comes from comes uh, corresponds to one of these vertices, and each a alpha one alpha two corresponds to an edge between you know alpha one and alpha two. This is alpha one alpha two, mm -hmm. and uh, the fact that like you know the the in this product like alpha, the last term is alpha k alpha one. It loops back means that like essentially you're looking at the the structures you're looking at are like paths. Uh, through the graph that mm -hmm. like eventually you know looks back or in other words you're looking at cycles uh, in this graph and you know because we observe that like any a alpha one alpha two has to be pure like exactly twice for for the most dominant terms like you're also looking at graphs that kind of like or cycles that you know go through each edge exactly twice right so right. so maybe using a different color here. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, like the 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 the, the edges, you, the cycles you really care about, for example, could be something like this. Uh, okay, so it loops back like this, and maybe it goes here, comes back here, and then loops back and loops back, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is mm -hmm. like a particular instance of a cycle where each edge appears exactly twice, mm -hmm. and um, from there is you know a counting problem. Of like how many are there of these kind of cycles, and it turns out it reduces to something that are well known from combinatorics called Catalan numbers, Catalan mm -hmm. numbers like from the, like the region of Spain, um, and uh, yeah, and from there like essentially you're pretty much done because the Catalan numbers are precisely the moments of the semicircle distribution. Oh, I see. You know, oh, okay. The, the I, double I mean, factorials I, are exactly the moments of the Gaussian distribution. I see. I didn't uh, actually. I didn't, uh, let's just take a step back. It, the 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 right hand side of this right semi circle law means that the probability distribution is some, is proportional to what one minus x squared. I assume, right? Uh, yeah. Right. Okay. So actually, you can. Uh, so if I worked hard enough, I could I could uh, I could perform. The moments of that distribution by hand, like just doing yeah. some 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 substitutions, it's pretty straightforward. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I mean, you okay. can reduce it to like some recurrence equation, and then that's like the recurrence equation of Catalan numbers. Ah, okay, okay, cool. I see. Okay, because I mean, there are many definitions of the Catalan number. I I've never seen it defined in terms of moments of the semi-circle law. I usually think of it as a more combinatorial uh, definition. But okay, I mean, uh, okay, great. So so the right hand side. Like, this essentially gives you a proof of that fact as well, like this construction, sure. because you sure, can- Sure, sure. Anything that satisfies the recurrence of the Catalan numbers are, are the Catalan numbers. And okay, so you just show that the right-hand side satisfies that. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied. Okay. So, okay. So, okay. So the, the point of, 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 of this is that for both the central limit theorem and the semicircle law for random matrices, the moment method uh, is tractable enough that you can do it by hand, uh, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Yep. So uh, let me also just kind of uh, fill in some details we missed here, uh, which is that like, how what's the right scaling for the matrix to mm -hmm. get a bounded uh, distribution in mm -hmm. the end? 
So like in, in particular, what I mean is like, what is the scale? What is the scale of this matrix? Like mm -hmm. what is the entry? So earlier we were saying like the, the entries are standard Gaussians with the variance one, but uh, but uh, the correct scaling to get, you know, a if you want something like this, like uh, I think negative one to one, I forgot the exact scale, it might be negative two, but, but let's say negative one to one, then you you need uh, the entries, the entries should be something like Gaussian of zero mean or variance one over n. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the, the typical size of each entry is one over square root of n. The standard deviation is one over square root of n, the variance one over n. So that turns out to be the right scaling for you to get like kind of like a finite non-zero uh, distribution as a limit of the eigenvalues. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that already came from from uh, looking at what you wrote here, because basically you see that if you absorb a square root of yep. uh, n into the denominator into a, then that that gives you this uh, variance of one over n. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, right. so in that sense, you know, it's it's kind of like analogous to central limit, where you know there's a yep. square root of n here, and essentially here we're multiplying the the matrix by square root of n yep. uh, on the bottom in the bottom. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right, Greg, so at long last, let's get to your tensor programs work. Why don't you um, tell us what it's all about? And yeah, let's see. <clears throat> right. Um, so um, maybe let me um, start by start from the random matrix angle. And um, let me motivate this <clears throat> by kind of continuing from this uh, moment method discussion, right? So earlier, um, well, maybe let me let me use a different color. Let me use a white color. So earlier we we're talking about how <clears throat> to compute the moments of, of the eigenvalue distribution. Uh, it suffices to compute um, the k power uh, of a matrix and its trace, right? And um, so the the point uh, that I'm gonna make right now is that. This operation, this this quantity that you want to calculate, can be written as a uh, kind of a series of like vector matrix multiplications. Okay, and the way it works is is like this. And, and so, so the the point of this, you know, going forward is that this set of computation can be abstracted into a more general framework of tensor programs. And then I'll talk about that framework, and then I'll kind of specialize back to this case at the end. <clears throat> So, okay, so first of all, I'm gonna just exp express this trace uh, as this uh, this expectation, uh, which is very trivial, but it's very useful. Where um, V is like a standard Gaussian. Okay, so so what I'm doing here is like here I just assume A is at some any determinacy matrix, and <clears throat> to compute you know the trace of A to the K or any any other matrix instead of A to the K that's fine too, like the trace is just the same as the expectation of V transpose times this matrix times V, right? So like this is this is a scalar, like because we're hitting this matrix by vectors on both sides, so you get a scalar back. And the point is that when you take expectations, <clears throat> essentially like the only contributions are gonna be from the diagonal of yep. this A to K, right? right? So so that gives you the trace, yep. okay? Yep. All right, so this is an entirely trivial trick, <clears throat> but what this allows you to do is to write this now as like a series of matrix multiplications. So so I can define, you know, like say, um, I'm gonna do this, so, <clears throat> I'm gonna write, um, let me call this, um, I say like X, I'll call this uh, X1 equals AK times V and then X, oh, sorry, A times V, X2 equals A times X1 and so on and so forth. All right, so then XK, I'm gonna define this to be you know, A times, X K minus one, right? So, <clears throat> so in effect, uh, 
the um you know x k is essentially a k times v right like I guess I don't need quotes here so um a k times v right <clears throat> and and the trace of a k is just equal to expectation over v of uh, x k uh, inner product with v mm -hmm. right <clears throat> okay so also just to know here that you know i'm using this notation where the superscript is a index not a power so like sure. sometimes depending on where you come from like this can trip you up this notation but uh in like more physics physics -y areas this is very common um okay so yeah so so this is a power and then this is an index just to be clear yep <clears throat> okay so so again everything on i have done here is completely trivial i just like re-roll the trace as some expectation and then re -roll this particular expectation as like a series of matrix of locations and then some inner product at the end okay so the significance of this is that <clears throat> You can reason like iteratively about each of these matrix locations in a principal way that allows you to calculate this uh, final uh, inner product expectation very easily, and this is kind of the the core insight between behind tensor programs, which is that like uh, like when you do matrix multiplications and nonlinearities, entry-wise nonlinearities, you can kind of keep track of uh, certain information about how. The, the vectors obtained from matrix multiplication or obtained from entry-wise nonlinearity, how they evolve with the operations in the limit when the uh, matrix size or the vector size become large. Okay, so <clears throat> in this particular case, the gist is that, so what's the gist, right? Gist is that um, every um, X, I, have um roughly uh id entries um as n goes to infinity so like roughly id is not i have not defined it it just like i just want to appeal to intuition that like is is kind of become the the, the entries uh become roughly independent <clears throat> and identically distributed as n at the I guess we're using large n here. It's the size of the vectors and the matrices called infinity. Um, and uh, okay, so this is assuming this is assuming like you know, um, for example, A has like Gaussian one over square uh, one over n entries. Yeah, and we're dropping the assumption that A is symmetric now, right? A all the entries are independent. <clears throat> uh, no, like no. I mean, for for this scenario, like a can be a can be symmetric, but I'll, I'll get to like kind of uh the, the the more general case where a is not symmetric. But yeah, okay. you can assume, like you know a has normal entries up to where like okay subject sure okay okay. I mean, in the case of neural networks, a won't be symmetric, but okay for now they yeah. it's symmetric. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I because I just want to stay uh in this uh this setting of uh uh symmetric matrices for symmetrical law yeah i was gonna say because if the if all the entries were independent uh gaussians then i think it would be automatic that the entries are identically distributed but not independent right uh yeah by symmetry you will be identically distributed um but yeah like you, you don't know whether it's independent or not yeah sorry for the non-symmetric case it's uh identically distributed i'm trying to think if it's symmetric is it also identically distributed i'm not sure uh for symmetric yeah i think so i mean you just you, if you permute the entries like you don't you shouldn't change any distribution ah oh, wait it's just like you have like this you know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Under yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> right. So, um, right. So, so that's the first point. 
that like the entries have a uh, roughly ID entry uh have the ID uh the sorry the vectors xi have roughly ID entries as n goes to infinity. And the second point is that like we can track the distributions of x i's entries through some calculus mm -hmm. through some calculus that I'll maybe briefly like cover next mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but um yeah roughly speaking maybe let, let me kind of like try to jump ahead a little okay. bit and okay. come back and fill in the middle the essentially the eventual conclusion is that you can associate um associate a random variable uh, z x i to each x i such that like x x i's entries look like um id samples from C X I. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. And <clears throat> and there's like a there's some some there exists a set of rules <clears throat> for computing um Z X I from Z X I minus one to Z X one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're, and, and I guess Z, let's say ZX0, where X0 is defined to be just V. Yep. Right, if you recall from the previous slide, X1 is A times V. So X0 naturally can be defined to be V. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, and V V was the uh, Gaussian with, with uh, unit uh, uh, yeah. variance, uh, right? Uh, yeah. Like okay. the, yeah, the, the uniform isotropic standard Gaussian. Yep. Okay. And so, so the punchline here is that like the thing we care about in the end was this expectation of inner product of x k and v, right? So we're let me maybe let me rewrite this given this definition as x zero. Then, like based on this intuition, right? This is uh, also I. Like uh, we actually need to scale this by like whatever n. So, so because we have the intuition that you know each each entry uh, of x k and x zero are identically distributed from like the z x i z s k and the z x zero, um, this is gonna be pr pretty much the same as you know this. Um, well, okay, so. Yeah, let, let me just write this out maybe. So I'm just gonna write this up. This is this is equal here. Um right. And mm -hmm. then our intuition is that like each of for each alpha, these two things are coming from the same or from respected distributions, ID samples. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this should look like yeah, in case it wasn't obvious, alpha is the is the coordinate. Subscripts are coordinate indices. Superscripts are are like indices vector, of right? yeah, like yeah. Superscripts correspond to different vectors. Subscripts correspond to the components of those vectors. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so this roughly like corresponds to um, like by a law large number kind of intuition, right? If you believe that. You know, xk alpha comes from z x k, and then uh, x zero comes from z x zero. Then this should look like the the expectation, the product of these two random variables, um, mm -hmm. when n is large. So, yeah. so what we expect is this as n, yeah. n to infinity. Let's just back up. Actually, so it seems like this way of bookkeeping is refinement of the moment method in the sense that the moment method moment method doesn't 
at least the way we discuss it, doesn't reuse er, er, any computation. For every K, you have to compute the moment from scratch, so to speak. Here, you're doing it step by step or in a neural network setting, layer by layer. And, and, and so you, you kind of are inductively kind of keeping track of the, of the distributions, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you can think of like that. I mean, like, so, uh, I mean, so if two different people, one method might mean something different, but in the way that we, we kind of phrase it, one method is just like overarching technique for like, you know, trying to like show that two distributions are equal if their moments match. And like the traditional way of using this moment method is trying to like kind of expand out some sum and then try to like see like what is the leading term of the sum, right? And in, in that case, like, you know, for example, in the random matrix case, we had to count like cycles that contains uh, each edge exactly twice. So that's like a combinatorial problem that a priori, you know, you kind of like you have to redo it for every power K, right? right? Exactly, exactly. Um, now, I mean, like, but but if you really unpack all the proofs, like kind of like one way, because eventually you do get to cata numbers and cata numbers are recurrently defined. So in some sense, like if you keep unwinding the proof, you have some kind of recurrence somewhere in the end, but it's like very kind of like implicit, you know, right. whereas here is very explicit. Like exactly, exactly. <clears throat> once you have, you know, this computation written down in this expression, you can just feed it to a computer and like essentially the computers can like just calculate what the Z's are and you know everything is like automatic mm. at that point. Mm. Um whereas for like more traditional methods, it's kind of a bit more ad hoc. Like, you know, there's some combinatorial problems that you know you might be able to do explicitly. There are others that you can't. The the master theorem in this case says that like for <clears throat> Maybe let's say like for any um like I'll just kind of say smooth enough, which is uh, in, in fact it's like a very mild condition here. But any smooth enough say um v, which is goes from R K to R, let's say um then um the following uh empirical average uh oh, let me let me do plus one because i want to put in um x zero which is v x one and so on and so forth to x k mm -hmm. all right so so this this thing is a scalar this is a scalar i'm i'm mm -hmm. adding you know, n scalars together and divide by n. So yeah. this will converge. And you also to... want to the individual components too, I believe. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this will converge to expectation of z x zero to z x k. All right. So so remember these are the random variable I have associated with each vector whose construction I did not tell you about, but I just told you that there is a construction like this. Um, and you know, in general, of course, like these these guys are correlated with each other. They're not in general independent random variables. Um, and uh, uh, like, yeah. So so this this kind of generally follows from the, st the structure of the program. Mm -hmm. There are programs where like these random variables can be independent, but in general, like in general programs, uh, computations like these um these uh, random variables are not independent, which reflects the fact that, you know, there are correlations between X0 and XK or X1 and XK and so on and so forth. Uh, when you kind of like, say, when you take inner product, right, when you're summing the product of entries, like that corresponds to like, you know, taking taking the expectation of the correlation or the expectation of the product of the two random variables, right? And, and these things are usually non-vanishing. Okay, so so yeah, so this is called the master theorem. Like this is a specific instance, you know, for the computation that we are doing here uh, for in the interest of the semicircle law and the moment method. Um, but of course, you know, like the uh, the 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 reason like this is really powerful uh, is because like when you have nonlinearities, uh, for example, in the case of neural network, this becomes like much much more 
or you, you can calculate much much more interesting things right rather than just you know a linear random matrix ensemble yeah sure let's just take a step back because uh, this is going to take a while for people to parse uh, i mean now it, it there's more i can see what's going on because i thought about it for a while but let, let's take a step back so sure. the how do i say um so um Okay, so so we've only defined these x0 through xks in the case where you're just applying a matrix A over and over again. Of course, uh, after this, you can tell us how, how, um, what a more general relationship is between these xis. There's, there's a more general class of transformations that can take you between these x's. But mm -hmm. for the time being, the, the point is the following. So you have these sequence of vectors of size n. Mm-hmm. Okay. And for any finite n, right, the entries are not ID. They're I for each XI, the components are uh, identically distributed, but they're not independent, but they're they're they get more and more independent as n goes to infinity. And the the reason why that statement is how that, that statement is, is is encapsulated by the master theorem is the fact that if you take um uh, if you average over all the samples, which is what this thing here is doing on the left-hand side, right? You're taking, uh, how do I say? Actually, I, I kind of cheated a bit. So if you if you go down the components, which is what this alpha is, right? Then if the these components in alpha were truly independent, then that is corresponding to taking IID samples of a common distribution, which is to say, that you are approximately averaging over the underlying probability distribution, right? And that that's what's the right hand side. So what I'm trying to say is that, like, here's what I'm trying to say, like, uh, um, for example, the expectation of f of x, where x is distributed as a unit Gaussian, right? That's the same thing, or it's approximated by this sum where X alpha are IID samples, mm -hmm. right? And it's the IID samples that tell you that the, the uh, empirical average converges to the expectation. In, mm -hmm. the, in the other extreme case where all the X alphas conspire to be correlated in, in the most degenerate case, if they're actually all identical, so they're all perfectly correlated, as soon as you know one X alpha, you know all the rest, then this sum just collapses to the evaluation of F on a single point, which is very far away from being the average over the distribution, right? So all I'm trying to say is that the right-hand side, let's just look at K equals zero, right? And K equals general K, just generalize what I'm saying. The fact that there's an expectation on the right-hand side is the statement that the left-hand side the components are becoming more and more independent as n goes to infinity, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 exactly. So, so in other words, like what the master theorem says, essentially just a recapitulation of what I was saying earlier that like the z uh, x i's are kind of like uh, encapsulates the distribution uh, under which like the entries of x x i uh, look i d. Mm -hmm. So like as the master theorem just says that like. The entries of these uh, all these vectors look id when n is large, and we can like see this by kind of like we're, we're like the way we can see this is that through the lens of a law large number they look i like id right yeah. like yeah. If, if like the l the x alpha are all actually id over alpha then this is like a trivial consequence of law large numbers yeah but of course like, in our situation they're not actually id they're correlated in some like somewhat complex ways. And the master theorem says that as long as we're only, you know, like kind of doing things like low large numbers where we average things, then it looks just like, you know, ID things. You can just pretend yeah. they're ID things and yeah. you can get back yeah. what you Yeah, or it's another way of saying it, the correlations, you know, vanish essentially as N gets large in, in this yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's great. So, so, and then it's kind of an exercise, I guess, to... How do I say? Uh, actually, I don't know. What, what's the next step? Do you want to 
revisit the RMT proof from this master theory, or do you want to just go to nonlinearities now? <clears throat> I can just mention that, like you know, like if you if I instantiate uh, the things I skipped over, then the expectation that you calculate, you know, using the z random variables are the same as the ones you would calculate from more conventional means. So, so that will give you a proof of the semicircle law. Okay, and then we move on. Okay, so maybe actually, it seems like you could just state it in words. So, so basically, um, let me let me just erase what I wrote. So basically, it sounds like a corollary can compute moments of uh, of uh, let's say from RMT via formula for computing disease, right? Because mm -hmm. the left-hand side, based on what we just talked about in the previous slide, can, is, is kind of the uh, RMT moment you want to compute, right? Just by, mm -hmm. by a change of variables, because we had the, right. So in this case here, phi is a function of k plus one variables, but in this case, it's actually a function only of the first variable and the last variable. It, it can just be independent of all the intermediate ones, right? That's right. That, that's yeah. legitimate. So yeah. you choose the phi such that it's the inner product of x zero and xk, and that gives you the RMT moment that you care about. And then yeah. you just now have to understand what the right-hand side is saying. And, and part of the tensor program theory is that there's a, a, a way of computing the Zs, and you just compute that expectation, and then you get the, 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 the answer you expect, right? That's right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, just, let me just finish that. So right-hand side, the uh, tensor program theory. And so, and, and, and then you get the answer you expect. Right. Yeah. 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 Great. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, great. So, so yeah. So just to, to make it really clear, this is how the tensor program master theorem, uh, re-derives the random matrix theory, uh, uh, uh moment yeah. computations. Um, yeah. the more, uh, the, 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 well, we've only illustrated in the case where you obtain the excess from repeated application of a matrix, can you now state it, the tensor program, what a tensor program is in a more general setup so that uh, we can see how it applies to neural networks? Right, right. <clears throat> I can write down like a more general formulation, but uh, roughly speaking, right, uh, what a tensor program is, like the most basic version is that uh, you have some initial objects, um, So the initial objects includes like you know some some vectors in Rn. So so for example, in our previous example, like the V uh is um is the initial uh vector calculation. Um so like you should expect um expect that um like um let me call these uh let's say x expect x to be sample from like a standard gaussian kind of thing like each entry will look like by definition these vectors will have id entries okay um and then you also have matrices say like I'll call them W. Yeah, this is the capital M, I guess, to be consistent with notation. So uh, these you should expect to um, be have like, to have uh, something like, you know, this kind of uh, entries with variance one over N and mean zero. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so this is the most basic version. There's like more advanced version that has a bit more data, but essentially, given these two uh, these objects, you can compute. We can you can like create new vectors via uh, two instructions. One is you know you can do matrix multiplication. So you know just if you have W and if you have X, 
where x can be either an initial vector or a, a vector that we have generated using these instructions, then you can form, you know, w times x, right? Which is also a vector in Rn. Rn. Okay, so this is one instruction for generating a new vector. Another instruction is null n. So here, suppose you have a bunch of vectors, which again, either are initial vectors or vectors you've generated pre previously using one of these two instructions, uh, say like x1 to xk, right? And then, then you can generate phi of x1 to xk. Where, where phi, so here where I'm using kind of like a deep learning notation where where phi it has the signature rk to r. And then the meaning of this is that if, if we define y to be this, then the meaning of this is that this notation is that y, each entry of y, each entry of this, this uh, expression is defined to be uh, phi of x alpha, f, x1 alpha to xk alpha. Yeah. Right. So I'm applying phi entry wise to the vectors. Yeah. So, so, so for people in machine learning, yeah, k is typically one because you apply it just to a single layer, but you're allowing a nonlinearity to allow it to act uh, across multiple layers, essentially, but always coordinate yeah. wise. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So, like, you know, the, when people say like entry wise nonlinearities, most people think of like ReLU or hyperbolic tangent or something like this. Yeah. But yeah, you can have more general things. And in fact, like people do use them. Like you can think of like, if you know about batch normalization, this is kind of like a, you know, multivariate nonlinearity in some sense, where like mm. X1, XK are like the the um, activations from different batches. Like one to K are the batch index, for example. Mm. Uh, you can think of a batch normalization this way. Mm. So, so it's just to say that like, uh, people do use kind of more, these more general types of, Entry-wise, not in your hmm. Okay. 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 So yeah. So here again, we have some initial objects, vectors, and matrices, and then we can generate new vectors using one of these two instructions, and uh, and then that's that's pretty much it for tensor programs. Just like these two, essentially these two instructions, and you know, what we had before. If you go to, go back to the you know, previous. Uh, slide about the master theorem. What we have here like applies exactly as before, where like x0 to xk are all the vectors in the program. Like x0, for example, can be initial, uh, and then mm -hmm. x1 to xk can be, can be generated, like which is exactly the case in example for the semicircle law we had just now. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so the, the mass but the master theorem holds exactly as written. Um, when x0 to xk are all the vectors in any program, right? Mm -hmm. and, and again, like we have <clears throat> omitted the exact way that we have constructed the zx highs. Uh, and, and of course, that is like kind of the, the key behind any actual calculation you will do. But like the spirit of this is that you know, when you multiply a uh, uh, matrix by vector, the resulting vector from this matmol like we'll have you know some correlation between the entries typically, right? But the the master theorem says that like you can always reason about them as if they have ID entries as the size goes to infinity, mm -hmm. right? So so that's kind of the the spirit of the theorem. Now again, like the the key thing you need really need to elucidate when you actually need to do computation is the construction of these, um, and like I mean also related like how do you like uh compute the new z's when you have a new uh vector from the old ones right i see okay okay so we just described uh, a much more general tensor program where we allow these non-linearities and the master theorem if you if we go back one slide applies to uh, this result oh, although actually i guess we <laughs> we have some redundant notation there's the phi for the evaluation and then there's the Phi for the non-linearity. Maybe let's call this a different letter for the. Uh, what do we want to do? Or, I mean, like it's yeah. I mean, yeah. Like uh, I mean, phi phi is just any you know. Yeah, you're um, right. Okay, fine. Yeah, there's there's yeah whatever. yeah 
Yeah, yeah. Phi yeah. is just a generic symbol. Okay, so there's there's the phi of the master theorem, which is your choice of a nonlinearity by which to evaluate things, and then yeah. there's the phi of slide fifteen, which is the uh, non the a symbol for a nonlinear map that you could apply uh, at any step when you want to apply one of these these rules. The point I was trying to make is that um, once we have these rules for generating sequences of vectors, then the master theorem on the previous slide. Uh, applies and and you get the mm -hmm. same uh, um, uh, asymptotic IID ness. Yeah. Right? yeah. Okay. So I think to round out our discussion because we've been uh, talking for a while now, why don't we um, specialize to the case of a feed forward neural network, uh, which is a particular kind of tensor program, and then we can um, uh, end with one of your more recent applications of tensor programs, which are the so-called ABC parameterizations. And their tensor programs mm -hmm. will be used to show that there's a family of very interesting limits of neural networks and and, and particularly the dynamics of the neural networks. Does that sound like a plan? Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Uh, yeah, before that, let me just briefly remark that, you know, like there's like a low discrepancy between uh, what I have written here for tensor programs versus like the semicircle law application where we assume the matrix to be symmetric. Uh, I just want to like briefly note that like this is easy to take into account uh, where you can like when A is symmetric, um, you can just write it as, you know, like W plus W transpose where like W is not symmetric, right? So you can always symmetrize and yep. then like the... You have to take into account the symmetrization when you express a program, but like, everything still works. Okay, great. So yeah. now, I'm and this, and yeah, and for those who are going to look at your paper, your first paper had uh, tensor programs with just these W matrices, and then your follow up work included transposes, right? Uh, because W transpose is not independent of yeah. W, and so you had to extend your framework to that. But okay, th those are kind of the details of your papers. But but yeah, just just a roadmap yeah, yeah. for anyone. So, so in particular, like really here, you know. I can do either W times X or W transpose times, uh, sorry, times X, where the W can be reused. Sure. Yep. Right. And this is where the power comes from because in a lot of computations, especially involved neural networks and also in the semicircle case, you're going to keep reusing the same matrix over and over again. That creates a lot of correlation between, you know, between the vectors uh, and uh, like keeping track of these correlation is like a very complex tax task. Mm -hmm. You you know don't know how to approach it. But like yeah. master theorem, you know, like I omitted I omitted a lot of details, but the theorem essentially allow you to do it in a mechanical way, which you know, makes like this really complicated mess very clean. Yeah, but just to double check in your first paper, I think every time you applied a W, it had to be a f a fresh new IID one. It was later that you allowed reuse. Is that right? No, no, in the first paper, you're already allowed reuse, but it's just that you, you can only, uh, you cannot do transpose. You okay. can only okay. use either W or W transpose, like okay. uh, consistently. You cannot use both W and W transpose. That's, okay. that's, okay. The, that's, that's the first paper and it makes things a bit cleaner uh, and uh, in, in the sense of like how you phrase the result and also like for the like, Gaussian processes applications, like that's usually only uh, all you needed. Uh, when you add transpose, there's like a lot of complications. With by okay. for it's a little more powerful, allows you to do more things. Okay. Okay. Just wanted to clarify. Okay. So let's. Okay. So let's now maybe fast forward to uh, neural networks and ABC. Yeah. Yeah. So so first of all, I just want to um, kind of write down what a neural network is and just make it clear that like this framework can indeed express the kind of computations in deep learning that people would care about. Mm -hmm. So um, usually in in uh, deep learning, you know, you have um, a, uh, a a neural network function, which I'll call f. And typically, I use xi for the input of the neural network. Uh, you know, like, you know, different people You're had different choices. But such a such a mathematician. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's Using a bit uncommon in deep learning, but um, it is what it is. You know. Okay. Like like people should be happy to expand their horizon of weak letters. Okay. But um, so so you know, like a typical neural network is just a composition of linear and entry-wise nonlinear uh, functions. So in this case, like a three, a simple three-layer neural network can be written as 
no, V times, or I'll just say V transpose times phi W times phi of U times xi. If xi is in Rd, then U is in R, uh, say, N uh, times D, and then W is, I'll just write the shapes down, N times N, and then V is, uh, like for a scalar output function, V is just um, uh, one times N. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, no, N times one because I'm doing transpose. I see. Do you uh, write it like that because you want you want the large dimension on the end, to be on and to be on yeah, the inside. On the, left side, yeah. on the left side, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So, uh, and, and just recall for the mathematicians, uh, like fees applied entry wise. Yep. Okay. So, um, let's. So I I just want to at least uh essentially make the point that you know like this is. Uh, this new neural computation can be expressed as a as a program, and uh, just for simplicity, I'm gonna assume like d d in fact is equal to one. Uh, the general case follows pretty straightforwardly, but this at least like for the first for the first intro to this, it helps to simplify this. So then in this case, xi is just a scalar, mm -hmm. and um, let's, let's just back up. So this is this is what you'd call a three layer. Uh feed forward neural network are also called a multi or sorry, a, um, a MLP, a multi-layer perceptron, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. So let me, let me just write that just to, just so people have the lingo down. So this is a sure feed forward or MLP, uh, neural network. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, so uh, to express like the forward iteration uh, of this uh, this function, we can uh, do the following. So, like first of all, you know, like in the program, you need to specify where the initial objects. So the initial objects are uh, the vectors uh, u and v. Uh, I mean, in our case, like they're literally in Rn. Uh, I guess we use big N here. And then there's initial matrix W, which is N times N. Okay, so, and then... Um, Sorry, vectors, oh, uh, you mean U, U psi, you mean, or? Oh, no, so like, uh, I mean, it doesn't... Oh. Matter like oh, size is going to be a constant. So, uh, in in this computation, size is a constant. I so see. Sorry, sorry. Ve you're distinguishing between vectors and ma matrices. Have to have are are n by n, whereas vectors are n by something that doesn't depend on n, like n n by a constant, n by d, and n by one. That's why u and v are vectors. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can think of it like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like it doesn't it doesn't matter a whole lot here because like because size is going to be like. Xi is not random. Like we're gonna like fix Xi in some sense. Like there's gonna be part of the sure, company. sure. So like I, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, U and V are matrices as well. It's just that you distinguish between vectors and matrices because a matrix for you in a tensor program is something that's n by n. That's all. I'm oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. matrix yeah. is like two dimensions going to infinity. Yes. Vectors are one dimension going to infinity. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's it. That's all I was trying to say. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. 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 Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, and then. You know, to compute, let, let's call, you know, like the result of u times i to be h1. Apply phi, you get x1. Apply w, you get h2. Apply phi, you get x2. And then you apply e times v, you um, get the output of the network. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I'm, I'm just going to essentially uh, express everything up to x2. Like the, the contraction by v, uh, it, it, you can... Yeah, you can do it multiple ways. You can like express it in a slightly more general tensor program, or you can like in this case you can just express it as like part of the master theorem, because like 
you can like think of V like contracting with X2 as, you know, like a sum of, you know, the entries, uh, which can be expressed as kind of like in, in the statement of the master theorem. So I'm just gonna, again, I'm just gonna express everything out to X2. Okay. So, so, you know, uh, change changing color back to white. So, no, H1 is E2 equal to, um, like you can, you can say like, I'll just say like on phi one of, uh, of U, right? Where phi one is just defined to be U times Xi. So just, you know, multiply each entry by Xi, right? And then X one is equal to of phi two uh, of H H one, where phi two is literally just phi, like from the from the definition of the, the neural network. Again, like you know, phi is applied entry wise, right? And so these are all like non then operations, sure. even though like H one was actually the phi one was actually linear. But just like Sorry. not in the sense of why are you general. calling phi one phi two? Uh, what's the subscripts on the phi? Oh, so like they're the they're the the fees. Uh, the 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 nonlinearity is applied in the instruction of nonlin. So remember, we have two instructions for generating new vectors. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go back to like page fifteen, right? Like there's a there's a fee here on page fifteen. If you can see where I'm scribbling. Yeah, yeah, but why are you calling phi sub one and phi sub two? What, they're just they're just different nonlinearities. I'm I'm defining I'm putting them in the form of the the nonlin instruction, the operation, which requires Oh, a, oh I, I see what you're saying. Okay, okay. Uh ah, okay. Okay. Phi one is just contraction with psi and phi two is is just a application of phi. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Got it. Okay. Okay. So, um, continuing on you know, to define H2. Now H2 is W times X1. And this is the first time we're using the map mode instruction mm -hmm. because, you know, W as we specified is a matrix. And, uh, you know, finally X2 is equal to phi of h2, you know, which is just like an it's a nonlinear operation again. Okay, so so you know it's again it's very obvious that uh you know like things that are that typically occur in your networks can be expressed this way. So you know, for people who are more versed in deep learning, like you know, more uh, familiar with like more advanced architectures like convolutional neural networks, residual networks, batch normalization, transformers, self attention, like, all of these things can be expressed this way. It just it gets a bit more complicated, but you know, like you can look at the papers where there's like explicit examples of these written down. Um, but again, like the the summary and the gist here is that I want I want to give an example of why. In neural network computations can be encapsulated in this general framework, this language, right? Um, and again, like the punchline is that once you can express all of these things in this language, then like you can apply this master theorem in on page fourteen. And uh, again, I omit uh, I omitted certain construction details about like what the Z's are, but you can kind of reason uh, iteratively through the program to understand the behavior when the width of the network becomes large, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we can get into some more advanced topics uh, in regards to, you know, like uh, why does knowledge of, you know, how large new networks behave, like give you a lot of, you know, power in practice, right? Mm -hmm. Like, Why do we care about this, especially in the age of like GPT, BERT, you know, uh, yeah. as, as new networks get larger and larger, they just get so much better beyond people's expectations. Yeah. Let me just make one comment, actually, based on what you just said. You said basically you can 
what you just did here was express this MLP as a tensor program. And if you just follow through uh, the master theorem and maybe uh, with one or, or more steps because of this V transpose, um, you, I think what you're going to get is that F uh, is, uh, is a Gaussian process, right? And, and, and this is how you can, you're going to get the NNGP if you follow your nose uh, through the master program. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So like, I just, so, I just wanted to mention that we don't have to go too deep, but right, right, right. So, true. so yeah. yeah. So roughly speaking, um, yeah, if, if you scale this last V in the correct way, um, then, uh, yeah, like roughly speaking, like the, the resulting distribution of F where the randomness comes from the sampling of V, W and U uh will become asymptotically a gaussian process yep mm -hmm. um and uh yeah and this is like so like you know again this this fact has a very long history dating back to the 1990s with refer neo for simple neural networks um and you know like kind of around 2017 there's some more works involving deeper neural networks um but like kind of every time you want to you know, let's say like a new architecture comes out, you have to kind of do a lot of things manually and then like spend a lot of time to see whether like, oh, this actually holds also in this case or not. And so it's like a very arduous process to like actually try to manually prove all these cases. Actually, if and I recall, it's, it's at least for MLPs, it's maybe even for convolutional networks. It's not that arduous in the sense that if you look at those proofs, what they implicitly assumed is that you, if you let the, layers go to infinity one by one uh, from from input to output, then you're basically applying the central limit theorem successively and, and things aren't too hard. What's difficult is if you let all the layers go to infinity at the same rate. That's that's the difficult part. And that's where your work fills in that gap essentially, right? Uh, yeah, and also like um, when they're like kind of, uh, for example, they're like, when you look at RNNs, recurrent neural networks, um, then if weights are tied, right, mm -hmm. like cross time steps, it doesn't make any sense to let each layer go to infinity at the same time because they're the same matrix, you know? Yeah, I see, uh, I see. So, so like, when, like, we're doing a lot of weight sharing, this is not a feasible thing to do. Okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, and also just to remark that, like, um, like, kind of, Going going further than this, right? So far, I was just talking about like how do you express, you know, what, like you, for different architectures, can you express right the 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 architecture in this kind of com computation? Um, but really, the the most powerful thing, the much more powerful thing to do is to actually, uh, which we'll do in a second, is to kind of like look at the entire computation graph training. So so, so not just expressing like a single floor pass of the architecture, but unrolling gradient descent into a very big computation graph. And then like understanding the behavior of the network after training. So this is really like one of the most powerful things you can do with tensor program because you can just unroll anything, any kind of iterative computation you care about uh, in this format. And when you want to do this, when you want to unroll, for example, gradient descent, then you must encounter, you know, like uh, the sharing weights because you need to use W uh, in the forward pass and W transpose in the backward pass and to iterate this many, many times, right? In, over the course of gradient descent. And like this kind of weight sharing pattern in this computation essentially prevents you from trying to do any kind of like the taking one layer at a time to infinity, right? Because you're sharing so much weight uh, within the computation. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Okay. Um, all right, sorry. That, that 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 aside took uh, took us maybe a little bit far, but okay, let's go back. So, uh, where, where did you want to go next? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, I can like talk a bit about, um, like you know how this foundation lets us understand the different uh, large width behaviors of neural networks, and like what the significance is in the age of large neural networks. Mm -hmm. I want to kind of, you know, make analogy uh, with things in mathematics, you know, in case uh, like mathematicians are uh, watching this video. Um, but, you know, like traditionally, 
you know, I think a neural network is thought to, you know, have like a single behavior when you take the width to infinity. And usually that's something associated with like a kernel or like a Gaussian process, you know, these kind of things. Um, and, uh, but, but it turns out this is not true, right? Like there's no, like these, these there's no a single one behavior uh, for large neural networks. In fact, there's like a very large space of possibilities uh, for how our large neural networks behave, depending on how you take certain hyperparameters, um, you know, how you, how you scale those hyperparameters as the width becomes large. So, uh, you know, this is kind of similar to certain behaviors we know from mathematics. Uh, as an example, you know, if you're more from a, like an algebraic background, um, then you must know that, you know, uh, while like the rational numbers has a very natural completion in the real numbers, uh, there are in fact like different completions of rational numbers uh, into other fields, like the p-adic fields for you know, p being any prime number. And uh, a, a very powerful result um, in this area is the classification of all you know, fields uh, that are completions of the rationals and which turn out to be, yeah, essentially the reals plus all the p fields. And from there, we have very powerful, you know, like localization results on how we can like, you know, uh, e equate the solvability of certain equations over rationals to the simultaneous solvability of the equation over the, all the reals and the p right? All the possible completions. And this is like a very powerful basis uh, from which like Langlands program now um, extends. Uh, and so just like this, when we look at, you know, like uh, infinite with neural networks, there are different ways of taking those limits, just like how there are different ways to complete the rational numbers. And in a sense, like to understand the behavior of a finite neural network is like roughly equivalent to understanding uh, the behavior of different limits uh, of infinite with neural networks. And like from this perspective, it becomes very natural to understand like what are all the possible infinite width uh, limits of these large width networks, right? And so this is like a very different perspective from the more traditional perspective that oh, when we take the width to infinity, like some kind of kernel behavior will happen. And like, you know, like if, and because the kernel behavior is bad, you know, we don't like the infinite width neural network. But in fact, like there are different behaviors and, and as we'll see, like there's in fact one behavior we really, really like and gives us some really powerful technology uh, in this uh, context of, you know, like huge neural networks like GPT. Yeah. Great, makes so, sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, um, right. So, so now let me kind of set the stage of like, how do we view the space of different limits, right? For each of, these parameter tensors, there are two numbers that you need to specify at the very least to uh, specify a training uh, procedure. Uh, one is the, I'll call it the initialization variance. Mm -hmm. um, so, so supposing that you sample these things with ID Gaussian entries with zero mean, then what is the variance? Uh, mm -hmm. that you should specify for those things. Mm -hmm. And then the, the second thing is a learning array. So, um, yeah, so for those of the viewers who don't uh, or haven't seen, you know, gradient descent before, like the, the you know, the, the gradient, just, just quickly, I guess, you know, gradient descent Essentially, it's an iterative algorithm which just says like to to if I want if I want you know some loss function so some like function of the neural network f to to become smaller and smaller then like you should update the parameters like so then you should get updated to u minus you know, some, this is the learning rate eta. Um, 
maybe okay let me be explicit here let me just just write learning rate instead of ADA learning rate times um uh okay let me write it in the gradient format the gradient of uh the loss with respect to you and likewise for the other things mm -hmm. Right. right. And then like this thing, you know, the, there's a lot of literature uh, for this, you know, how do you say that this, this learning rate in the convex literature? It's a very old topic, but you know, like there's much less uh, understanding of, of this, uh, this learning rate in the non-convex setting uh, where you're optimizing neural networks. Mm -hmm. um, but in any case, like this, this neural network, uh, this parameter learning rate is what we need to set, right. For, for these, each of the UWB. Okay, mm -hmm. so, uh, right, okay, so, um, in particular, when we talk about, like, large n limits, right, where n here, in this case, is, uh, oh, I, I shouldn't write here, I guess. So, so actually, let, 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 I should back up. So, what, what we have is, uh, um, let's actually, let me just introduce it in a notation, which is quite standard, just so it'll be a little easier to talk about. So let theta be the set of all parameters. In this case, theta is U, W, V, sort of all parameters, like ne neural network parameters, mm -hmm. right? And so we have a random function, a random neural network function, which depends on this random parameter theta, and for each loss function L, so L here is what's called the loss function. You're trying to minimize your loss, right? That gives you gradient descent dynamics. In other words, uh, you can run this gradient descent step by step, and that gives you a discrete sequence of uh, neural networks given by just updating uh, sequentially under this gradient update rule. Mm -hmm. And the question you're trying to ask, so we haven't seen the question. It's a question, what kind of... scaling limits exist for the dynamics of F. By dynamics of F, I mean, it's not just that the, the limiting F exists at initialization, but the entire gradient trajectory must also exist, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, great. And, and like the different behavior of these scaling limits depend on how you scale this uh, initialization variance in the learning rate, right? For each uh, of W and W, uh, U, W, and V, right? So for, for example, like one way you can scale this is say, like I want uh, the initialization variance of V to be, uh, maybe let, let me let me erase this and, and abbreviate it so things are more aligned. So learning rate. Um, so for example, I can say, uh, let's and have variance scale like, uh, I guess we should use big N here, big N to negative one here, and then big N to negative one here, big N to negative one here, right? And then learning rate can be like just one, mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, so here, just to clarify, like I just mean like how you should scale these things, I don't mean exactly setting these two uh, such values, but just like, you know, like the initialization variance should should half when you double n, right? That's that's all I mean, right? Like there can be constants in front of it. Um, sure. So when you specify such a scaling relation uh, in powers of n for uh, these hyperparameters for u, w, and v, like any such choice specifies one way to take the limit, right? Uh, when you let n go to infinity, and that gives you one set of behavior. Um, yeah, so you will turn out, for example, um, yeah, in this case, like uh, when you specify like, like these hyperparameters, uh, the neural network actually will actually blow up to infinity, like after one step. Mm. Um, and 
Okay. So, so like in general, right? Like in general, if we, or, or just to elaborate further by one step, you'd be basically, even if the limit exists at time zero, the limit does not exist at time equals one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah. So in general, right? Like you have in this particular case, there are six numbers you need to specify. Um, so like, I'll just call this, um, um, like using the, the this notation from uh, ABC franchisation, I can call it negative B here. And then negative, oh, sorry, negative C here. So there are six numbers like the B and C for each V, W, and U, okay? And um, yeah, each way of like specifying these numbers give you a set of behavior uh, when you take n to infinity. And you know, kind of to connect to to the all the previous things we talked about, like the 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 reason that we can't understand all of these diverse set of behaviors when you take n to infinity is because we have this tensor prime machinery where we can for any set of B and C we can express that computation in a tensor program and take the limit. Again, it's like automatic because you have the master term and you can just automatically calculate what is it what is the behavior right in the in the infinite n limit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay so now like the question is uh what does this landscape of limit look like right so again like kind of using the analogy with p addicts right like we know that the completions of the rational consists of like p being all primes p addicts and the real number uh that the real field like what is the corresponding picture for neural networks, right? When we vary the set of B and C, right? So like kind of the B, the Bs and Cs here are kind of like analogous to, you know, like the P in P addicts, right? Where P ranges over primes in that case, but here B and C can be any real number. Um, and like roughly speaking, uh, you can like, uh, in this particular case, like there's like, it's a six dimensional space. Um, and you can actually like partition the space and kind of classify uh, what what the like the, the partition of the space looks like. Okay, so 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 the see, this is a picture right here. And so it's a six dimensional space, but obviously we cannot draw um, six dimensions. So instead, uh, I'm gonna just give you kind of like you know like project this to a two dimensional thing using like a nonlinear projection. I'm gonna distort something. I'm think, gonna take some quotients. But I just don't want to like carry across like the the most important features of this. But so this is like the six dimensional space. This is like the space of um the B U B U B W B B and the C U C W and C V. So this is the R six yep. space. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. but okay, we draw in two dimensions. Yep. Okay, so um, the point for first of all is that like most of the space, if you like throw a random dot in R six, like according to the Lebesgue measure, whatever that means, you're gonna get like some pretty uninteresting limits. So, so this is like the, this uh, this background. This is like a, like the mm -hmm. measure, the full measure background where um, essentially you have two behaviors, two two uninteresting behaviors. One is that like the training blows up in the limit or, or the training gets stuck. Uh, at initialization. So in other words, like when you do gradient descent, it doesn't change the function at all. Okay. So, so these are, you know, neither of these are interesting, right? Like you, you get, you don't get any interesting function. So if it blows yep. up, you get a not, not well-defined function. If it gets stuck in initialization, you have learned nothing from the data, right? So like mm -hmm. very, very uninteresting. Um, and then it turns out that it's like a, like a code dimension one or I guess, yeah, at least code dimension one, I forgot exactly how, how what's the code dimension, but uh, there's a space um, in, in the middle of this, the C of uninteresting things where you actually get, you know, like non-trivial behavior and so 
I kind of drew a quadrilateral here. I mean, general is kind of like a, a higher dimensional uh, polyhedron. But the, the salient feature here is that um, uh, you have um, like uh, all the all of the points in the interior along uh, with the points in the lower boundary here. So maybe let me, let me use a different color here. So like the lower boundary here, uh, plus like the interior here, they're gonna be in what's called the kernel region. So what that means is that um, the neural network uh, will evolve or will have very simple behavior uh, in the limit, in the, in the sense that like the function f uh, at time t in the grain descent evolution, you know, using using the grain descent algorithm we talked about uh, in the last slide, uh, it's gonna evolve something like ft equals ft minus one minus the learning rate um, times a a kernel k times ft uh, t minus one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so this is uh okay. So also, like this is like a the simplest case when you use um, the, the square loss where you, this is like literally a linear equation mm. where K is, you know, it's like a linear, you know, operator on F. Mm -hmm. um, let me just write this down, linear operator. So so this K would, will kind of change when you, as you traverse through this space that I, I kind of colored in here. Like okay. you know, this so so the point is that you know if you look at the limit determined by this set of B and C, and then another limit determined by this set, and another limit determined by this set, you, in general, uh, they all satisfy a linear equation of this form, assuming mm -hmm. square laws. I see. Um, but the kernels can be different. The k can vary between them. I see. But they all I satisfy see. kind of linear equation. Do we have okay. explicit characterization to that? So for the NTK, it's basically the the um the, so, so the, ntk yeah. is here this is like the ntk limit it's actually like a vertex in this polyhedron um and uh yeah for for k like for, so for any of these you can kind of calculate exactly what the kernel is based on okay. you know what the b and c's are um yeah it's, just, it's a recursive calculation based on the program structure based on the architecture of the neural network oh i see i see okay because the, the ntk uh, has this very special form of being the gradient of the function times itself, but it also has a recursive structure. And you're saying the most general kernel is just defined by that recursive structure. It might not be so simple as, you know, grad F dot grad F, something like that. I mean, like, so like, um, cause the NTK has a yeah. very simple characterization in terms of, uh, the function itself, but in general, it has to be something more recursive. Uh, I mean, in general, it does look something like grad F dot grad F, uh, mm. but it just like what, depends on what the B and Cs are. Like you actually will kind of zero all part of the grad, for example. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, okay. Anyways, yeah, just wanted to right. understand. Okay. Great. So, 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 so from a mathematical perspective, this kernel regime is very nice because a priori, like we have no idea how the non-convex, you know, evolution of the function goes under gradient descent, right? Like. This is right. kind of like all the convex optimized uh, optimization theorists. They kind of like all vex over this problem. But now if we take this limit, this becomes a convex problem. So it's a linear problem even. And uh, like you, you can obtain a lot of results on the optimization uh, trajectory of such functions in the in the limit, in these kernel limits. So like mathematically it looks great. But, and this is like a very, very, very big but, uh, the problem with this is that there's no, uh, it does not exhibit the behavior we know as feature learning. Okay, so so what that means is that uh, if you look at, you know, go back a slide to slide 17, and you look at, you know, the equation for f of xi, like feature learning can be, at least like the, the lack of feature learning roughly means that if 
you know, X2 of, you know, an input is like equal to X2, uh, let me call this, um, okay, let, let, me, let me write this down. So if X2 apply to an input, uh, at initialization time, so without training, without seeing the data, is is equal to x two of xi after training. If this is, so, we, we say that like there's no feature learned for input xi, and when we say like there's no feature learning, it means like this is true for any input xi. So I think I think the more proper way of saying that because x two is going to become uh, it's a vector of n coordinates and n is going to infinity. I think the point is the entry wise, the the change in coordinates is little o of of one essentially. It's going to zero, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, roughly. So like that's like a more pedantic way of of saying this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like essentially, um, right. Each each entry, if like the change in the in the entries of x is much smaller than the entries themselves at the beginning, mm -hmm. then uh, then essentially there's no features. Learn, okay, right? and I think this is something that that people might have a hard time understanding because the how to say it, the function f can still change even though there's no feature learning because the vectors are getting bigger. So even though their their coordinates the the, the coordinates are themselves changing uh, ever so less and less, uh, you know you could you can have an overall effect just because when you multiply by a large weight matrix, large meaning an n by n, where n is large, all those small diffs can add up to an O of one diff at the very end of the function, right? So it's sort of like, it, there's, there's two different diffs going on. There's whether the function changes, the f of theta of psi, versus whether the individual neurons or components change. And even though right. the neuronal changes are going uh, to zero as n goes to infinity, the function overall still changes just because there are right. many neurons, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, like I said, that like most of the space, uh, like like in the in this island in the middle of the picture, most of the the you know the limits, right, correspond to these kernel limits, which mathematically is very nice because you you have simplified the behavior of complex neural networks, of mm -hmm. complex finite neural networks, mm -hmm. but it has a very tragic behavior of not being able to learn features, and mm -hmm. this is this is like. Like really, I think from a mathematic mathematical perspective, it's hard to appreciate how important this is in real you know settings. But like all the things that we love, uh, from you know the empirical success of e learning today, you know like ImageNet, Bird, GPT, like all the success comes from the fact that these new networks can learn really really good representations of like pictures or language, right? Like this, like this X two in the previous slide is kind of like it's some new networks internal representation of like a picture of a cat, for example, or like where if the Xi is a picture of a cat, or, you know, Xi can be like a sentence, right? And like, so it's like an internal representation of the semantics of sentence. And like, if if uh, you do not have feature learning, then like all this representation is like nonsense. Like, it doesn't even know about like the, the data at all. It's just like something that would be the same as if you just blindly choose a random representation. So, so this is a really bad, bad, um, bad behavior, right? No feature learning. So like, if you just look at the picture like this, it sounds, it sounds like, okay, this looks like infinite with new networks are just bad, right? Because anything you pick here probably does not do feature learning. But if you squint very closely, in fact, like the, the last part that I haven't talked about, which is like the upper border of this um, polyhedron, this actually does exhibit feature learning in the sense that like the, in the previous slide, like the X2 um, uh, does not, uh, does not like get stuck at the, at its uh, value and initialization, but it does evolve. And in fact, you can like squint even more closely and like you'll see that the upper vertex here, like it's kind of maximally Feature learning. I'll just say that. Okay. In a very like in a sense that can be precisely formulated, but roughly speaking, it's like saying that anything that can learn features, like all the parameters that can learn features, will learn features. Like if anything that can move away from neutralization, you'll move away from neutralization. I see. 
I, my guess, just thinking about this, um, how do I say? You wrote it as a point because basically, uh, okay, so the way you drew this picture, the kernel regime is consists of the interior of this polytope and some of the faces. Yep. And since this is a high dimensional polytope, then you're going to have many co-dimension faces and yep. higher co-dimension means more features are being learned. And uh, yep. the, the point at which you've used up all your co-dimension so that you're at a single point, all your, all your layers are learning, right? And yep. so that's why you yeah. have a single yeah. point, right? Yeah, okay. that's right. Good. Mm -hmm. that's yep. right. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, okay, that makes sense. Um, I think we did get to everything you wanted to say. I just wanted to rewind a bit because you made this kind of comment that I uh, wanted to push back, but I didn't want to interrupt you. You said... Uh, yeah. uh, I mean, a, lot, a lot of things in machine learning are, are quite poetic, philosophical, or, or subjective. And I think this is one yeah, of them. Yeah. You said that sure. uh, no feature learning is, is bad, but I wanted to push back just a little bit because I think that might be a little bit too strong of a statement because there are regimes in which the NTK does well or even better than neural networks, especially low data regime, right? So I, I, I want to qualify bad a little bit. Just, it's not that there's something fundamentally bad about no feature learning. It's just that in practice, uh, we have gotten the gains that we've seen from very large neural networks because they do feature learning. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, we know that kernel methods do well when kernel methods do well too. It's just that kernel methods don't scale well. Sure. So it's you know sure. if yeah, if yeah. you if, if if the kernel computation wasn't a bottleneck, it's unclear what would happen if you fit a kernel to you know millions and billions of images or pieces of text. Right? It's just that we can't do that computation. So I I, I want to just maybe uh, kind of push back in that sense. Uh, yeah, so uh, definitely, you know, when you, um, yeah, like in low data regimes where like you essentially need to specify some kind of um, inductive bias. Yeah, I mean, kernel is just like one way to specify this bias and it could be, it could work better than neural networks. Um, yeah, I mean, so like, again, like when if kernel methods work better than neural networks and like it's potentially also true that even without feature learning, a kernel limit will also work better than a finite neural network and you know, whatever that, that means. I mean, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Though I, I, I kind of like don't really feel like uh, even if you can scale the kernel methods, you will do better than, you know, like deep learning, um, like in in a large data regime. Even if you can compute it, like that's kind of my feeling. Like I mean, we have very concrete uh, results on this on CFR ten, like you know, how many like meta learning kind of things. But anyway, like. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so, there's a whole like, there's a whole cottage industry of showing how kernels and neural networks differ. Uh, I'm I'm not up to date sure, on that sure, literature, yeah, but yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so maybe like I'll I'll kind of finish up by kind of talking about like how this maximal feature learning limit really translates to r really good great gains in terms of like empirical performance in your networks, or like allowing us to do things that we couldn't do before. Okay, so so maybe let, let me kind of come back to uh, some some problems with empirical deep learning, right? So uh, today, like in like the the best the best neural networks are essentially the largest neural networks trained on a lot of data, and like the advantage is so apparent that larger neural networks are better. That essentially, like to train the best model, you want to throw all your resources at training that model, right? So like you know like for example, like when companies like OpenAI, DeepMind, Google, like they, when they are confident that this is like, like we should scale up this method, they just throw all their compute at this training this one model. And um, when you do so, you have essentially one shot to make it succeed, right? Like a lot of things can break when you do this, you kind of put all your eggs in the same basket. Like just you, your eggs can break for like very mysterious reasons because that like, you, kind of almost by definition, you have never done experiment in this scale because you're literally throwing all your compute at it, right? Whereas like during the experimental phase, you're going to use smaller amount of compute. So uh, when problems occur at that large stage, uh, it's very costly in terms of, you know, like the computation, the GPU hours, the energy, and also like the man, the, the, the man hours in terms of like trying to fix this, these problems. Um, and uh, in particular, like a lot of these problems come from like, for example, batch choices, hyperparameters, which will like kind of just make the networks diverge 
uh, uh, during training for, for, for no apparent reason. Um, and like the, the way people do it now is, you know, for example, things like learning rate and these initialization scales, they just kind of randomly guess, like roughly speaking, it's just like something similar to what they've used for smaller models, but that actually leads to a lot of problems. Like with these large models, just things will break or you just like do worse than your smaller models, right? In which case you spend a lot of money for nothing. Um, so it's in, important to like, like kind of predict like if you extrapolate your compute to extraordinary amounts, like what is the right hyperparameter or what are the right hyperparameters to use for that, you know, like a large uh, model training run. And it turns out that like this uh, on, on the page 18, like this maximal feature learning limit, like which essentially is a choice of the Bs and Cs, which themselves are like, recipes for how to scale your hyperparameters as your model size change. Like this turns out to have the very like useful property that as you scale your neural network larger and larger, uh, if you follow the recipe given by these Bs and Cs, then if you're, you're, you start with a set of hyperparameters, which are optimal, like a set of learning rates and initialization, which are optimal for a small model, and you scale those hyperparameters according to you know the Bs and Cs. So for example, if the Bs are one, so like it means like an, an inverse, then you want to scale those so that like you half number when you double the width, right? So if you scale them like so, then you you're guaranteed that like things will stay approximately optimal as n goes to infinity, right? So no no matter how big you scale your model, you have some kind of guarantee that you're never gonna be far away from the optimal hyperparameters you could use if you tuned uh, all the hyperparameters directly on the large model. Sure. I mean, right. the point is this, like uh, having a limit is a, st is a stability result. It's saying that as you let n get large, something is converging to something. Yeah. And this maximal update... Uh, uh, well, I, get, I didn't um, say maximal update here, but... Yeah, okay. Yeah, it is the maximal update. Uh, right? Yeah, this so is you, called you, the maximal update parameterization. AKA mu p. Yeah. Yeah. This is your fifth and most recent paper. Uh, yeah. So, so, uh, yeah, this, this maximal feature learning maximal update is such that because of the stability guarantees of this, of this, uh, convergence result, you're able to transfer hyperparameters in a theoretically grounded way. Yeah. 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 And like it's, uh, it's like this. This is like the unique one that can do this in the general case. Uh, I mean, which is kind of if you think about it, it's obvious because, like, the auto hyperparameters has there's only one way to scale it, right? If you're God, you know how the hyperparameters scale. And if this mm -hmm. is like the one thing that can do it, then no other way of scaling can do it. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, if you tried to use any of the, these other green ones, why can't you transfer hyperparameters? Uh. Like, so, so I'm just saying here, I'm just saying that if, like, if anything, if anything can do it, if there exists an optimal way of scaling hyperparameters, then no other way of scaling it is optimal, right? Kind of by definition, because there's only one way to do it. Sorry, I, so I'm not following. Like, like, all these green points have infinite width limits. They, they have some feature learning. Can you also, uh, like they, they don't no like they don't right because uh okay i mean so so like the the concrete answer for example is something like this uh like if in the uh, any green point other than the mu p point um essentially differs from mu p uh in the sense that like some like learning rate is goes to zero effectively goes to zero okay. as uh, the width goes to infinity so if like that hyperparameter like, right, like it, like the auto hyperparameter for for that learning rate is probably like not actually zero in the in the limit. So like to compensate for this, like in that parameterization, your nominal learning rate would go to infinity, right? In that parameterization, okay. compensate for the fact that you, the, it goes to zero in that parameterization. I see, I see, I see. Basically, like, okay. You you I, I think the point is that you bought you want both the features 
learning to converge and the hyperparameter to converge. If one goes to zero, the other one has to go to infinity. So, so you, yeah, you don't want like, that situation. Yeah. So, so like really the, the thing, the simple thing I want to say is that if you know that the optimal hyperparameters scale one way, right. And like you, then you change parameterization so that like, like, you know, fixed hyperparameter goes to like the infinity or zero, then obviously that's not the right way of doing it. Like, mm. does that make sense? Sure. I'm just saying yeah. like, I there saying. can yeah. only be one way to scale. If you know that, like, like, you know, you know, there is, you know, you know, a particular scaling is correct. Like it preserves optimality. Then no other scaling can do the same thing. Right. It's like, it's, sure. it's, it's, it's a uniqueness property. Sure. 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 Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I, okay, yeah, we, we're just, just get to optimality. Uh, yeah. optimality is unique, right? Yeah, so yeah. If you know this thing is optimal, yeah. then you I'm just saying something optimal. really dumb, which is that like if you if you try to do like the law of large numbers with n squared instead of n, well, your learning rate, which is could be thought of as your coefficient in front of that quotient, yeah. could could blow up by being n, so that you have n over yeah. n squared equals one over n. Exactly. But that's like that doesn't count. That's cheating, right? So yeah, so exactly. you you want yeah. yeah okay yeah okay exactly. anyways yeah. okay I think I think we understand each other. Okay, anyways, I think this is probably a good place to stop. We've talked uh, for quite a while now. Um, yeah, this was a lot of fun, Greg. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, very, very deep and beautiful mathematics. Uh, part of the reason why I wanted you to be on my podcast is that I think mm -hmm. uh, you're, honestly, I think you're, I mean, I, I mean, your work certainly is is recognized by uh, by people, but I think it deserves to be known more. I I, I don't know how many people in the in the pure math community have, have come across it because of course you're an AI researcher in the industry. You don't even have a PhD. So I guess maybe, maybe <laughs> you know, academics haven't picked you up. I don't know. But I hope this gets developed further and and you know it, it will be appreciated by both mathematicians and and machine learning practitioners. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. I appreciate yeah this opportunity to talk it out with you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks, man.